Good afternoon. The first item of business is a debate on motion 9927 in the name of Jean Freeman on building a connected Scotland, tackling social isolation and loneliness together. Any member who wishes to speak in this debate, I would urge you to press your request to speak buttons. And I call on Jean Freeman to speak to and to move the motion in her name. Thank you, presiding officer. I'm pleased today to open this important debate about an issue that has rightly gained prominence. Social isolation and loneliness are now recognised as having a major impact on our health and well-being. And whilst it has often been talked about as something that affects older people, the fact is that it can affect any one of us at any age and any stage of our life. It is important to understand what we mean when we talk about social isolation and loneliness. Social isolation is about the quality and the quantity of social relations a person has. Loneliness is a subjective but important feeling based on a person's perception of their social connections, and both matter. Before I go much further, I want to commend the important work taken forward by the Equal Opportunities Committee in this previous parliament into age and social isolation, the first of its kind, at least in the UK, if not further afield. Yes, I will. I will. Thank you, Minister. Um, would the Minister, along with myself, welcome the appointment of a UK Government Minister to lead on loneliness for the United Kingdom? Thank you very much, and thank you for raising that. I do indeed uh, welcome that appointment and have written to the Minister, Tracy Crouch, congratulating her on her appointment and offering to work with her uh, and share our draft strategy. Um, the uh, Equal Opportunities Committee in the previous Parliament, which I was uh, speaking about, had as its first recommendation that the Scottish Government should develop a national strategy to tackle social isolation. There have, of course, been other important developments since then, uh, not least the one that Ms Wells herself mentioned, but also members will be aware that before her death, Jo Cox established a Commission on Loneliness. She recognised it is an important human issue, one that does not discriminate and, in her words, is everyone's business. Following her tragic death, her parliamentary colleagues have taken this work forward and late last year the Commission published a call for action for governments to show national leadership in this area. Last year, I was privileged to meet Brendan Cox to discuss our work and theirs, and I'm grateful for the Commission's support and encouragement for the leadership that we, and I hope from today, this Parliament is showing. On Tuesday, I was both proud and pleased to take an important step when I launched the draft of our national strategy for tackling social isolation and loneliness, a connected Scotland. In it, we aim to articulate a vision of the kind of Scotland we need to build, one where community connections are increased and everyone feels able and encouraged to participate as they want to. I visited the Hidden Gardens in Glasgow, a fantastic example of a community-based project supporting people to connect socially, community-driven work that is absolutely vital if we are to see change. Presiding officer, all the evidence tells us that this is an important issue we need to address. The Campaign to End Loneliness Review highlights that loneliness has comparable impacts on our health to smoking and obesity. And Age Scotland has pointed out that it can increase the risk of mortality by 10%. It's been identified as a serious public health issue by the Mental Health Foundation, Age UK, and many others. And further evidence tells us that being lonely or socially isolated can lead to depression and contribute to an increased risk of dementia. Carers UK suggests that eight out of 10 carers feel lonely or isolated. And in the first half of 2016, 31% of callers to Silver Line Scotland identified loneliness in how they were feeling. The Go Well study in deprived areas in Glasgow found that just over 31% of working age adults who were disabled or suffering long-term health conditions were frequently lonely and that 17% of men and 15% of women in those areas reported frequent loneliness. Childline figures for 2016-17 reported a large number of counselling sessions focusing on loneliness, 
with the majority of these being with girls. So we know the significant physical and mental health impacts, and we know that particular groups, carers, those living in poverty, young mothers, those in poor health, disabled people, the bereaved, our LGBTI community, and those in our ethnic minority communities all face an increased risk of suffering from social isolation and loneliness. But presiding officer, above all, this is an issue that touches each one of us. It may be something that we ourselves have experienced, and it is more than likely that each one of us know of someone or worry about someone who is right now feeling lonely or isolated. So there can be no one-size-fits-all approach, nor is it a problem that can be legislated away or fixed with a single initiative. As a government, we have already taken important steps. Our Community Empowerment Act strengthens the voices of communities in decisions that matter and has the ambition for truly meaningful local decision-making through the decentralisation of power. We've invested significant resources in supporting local community-based projects. Last year, our half million pound social isolation and loneliness fund demonstrated that small grassroots initiatives can have a profoundly positive impact on the number of social connections a person has. But this is about more than just money. It is about what all of us can do to build a more connected, cohesive and connected society. We have to challenge and tackle the stigma surrounding social isolation and loneliness. Stigma that makes too many reluctant to admit that they are lonely or feel isolated. Stigma that somehow makes it feel that it is your fault that you're in that position or that you're a burden. It takes away whatever confidence you had and makes you retreat from the social connections so vital to our well-being. Recent work by the Carnegie Trust identified that kindness can go a long way to reducing social isolation and loneliness. And this work has kick-started a real conversation about the role kindness can play. I want to ensure our approach to tackling this matter is informed by these conversations. And with so much of what we as a government need and want to do, tackling social isolation is not the responsibility of one part of our work, it is a collective responsibility across government. So we will continue to promote positive health and well-being and support the development of strong and positive relationships by giving our children and young people the best start in life. We'll continue to tackle poverty and inequality through the 50 concrete actions of our Fairer Scotland Action Plan and continue to support and recognise the key role played by the third sector and volunteers in our society. We'll continue to ensure our places and spaces encourage people to get out and about and able to shape their own environments. We know that accessible public transport is vital to people being able to remain socially active, particularly in rural areas. So the transport bill we will bring forward will aim to give people access to the best possible services. And because we know that people can undoubtedly connect through the tremendous national asset of Scotland's rich culture and heritage, we'll seek to reflect the importance of this in our cultural strategy. And we'll continue to invest in our country's national digital infrastructure to ensure that people can connect beyond their local communities. So we're already doing a great deal already. And it is right that we see how each part of the work I've mentioned and more can contribute to the task at hand. We have an important role to play as government and leadership to show. But the real impact will come by working together. National and local government, of course, but working with and listening to our communities, our neighbourhoods, neighbourhoods, our third sector organisations, our businesses. A partnership that harnesses and values our collective expertise and experiences. So this draft strategy rightly emphasises that people and communities themselves have a central role in building and maintaining social connections and supporting those who may be socially isolated. And that our role, the role of government, is to create the conditions that allow the ideas and initiatives that grow from communities to flourish. It's an approach 
that involves everyone because we need everyone. It's not top down and it's not ground up, but it is working together. The solutions lie in our communities. Each one of us knows of a local activity or initiative that works because it goes with the grain of that community. We know of work that isn't directly focused on tackling loneliness, but by bringing people together for one purpose, increases and reinforces the social relationships we all need. Last night, I heard of an NHS-driven initiative to help older people exercise to reduce the likelihood of falls and increase their body's capacity to recover from a fall. That, that initiative also provides real lived evidence that its work reduces feelings of loneliness and improves mental health amongst those who go along. Or the men's shed that draws in a dis disparate group of individuals who discover talents that they didn't know they had and shared interests that would have gone unknown but for that locally devised and locally driven opportunity, but who on Tuesday took the opportunity to make sure that I knew that they felt as individuals less lonely and more connected. Governments don't do that, people do. And our job in government and across this chamber is to recognise that and use our resources and our powers to support and encourage that work. And regardless of our political differences, recognise that on this issue, the challenge for us all is to show collective leadership. So I want us to ask ourselves four questions. What needs to change in communities to reduce isolation and loneliness and increase social connections? Who can play their part and what can they do more or less of? What do we as a government need to do to empower and create the conditions for positive change? And what can I do? A question each of us should ask ourselves in my own community to tackle loneliness and social isolation. The draft strategy sets out the work that is already happening and is led by government, the third sector and local communities. It sets out the evidence behind the issue and the information to increase our understanding. But above all, the draft strategy invites all of us our stakeholders and the communities of Scotland that we serve to start a dialogue that is open and cooperative, one that listens and focuses on the task at hand and on the concrete steps we can all take to tackle and reduce loneliness and social isolation. Presiding officer, this draft strategy signals this government's commitment to tackling social isolation and loneliness. It sets out our belief that we have to do more to empower communities to lead in this area and that our role is to create the conditions for change to happen and to lead by example. Building a connected and cohesive Scotland is, in everyone's, is everyone's business. I move the motion in my name. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call on Annie Wells to speak to and move the motion in her name, amendment in her name. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity to speak in this vitally important debate on social isolation and loneliness. With 79% of adults in Scotland experiencing loneliness, it's important that we get it right. And we have seen with recent media coverage and support for continuing the legacy of Joe Cox, real momentum is building. Which is why I am pleased to see that the Scottish Government welcomes the appointment of the new Minister and offering to share this draft strategy. I am greatly encouraged by a national strategy that seeks to tackle this issue, making it the responsibility of everyone, from government down to local communities, to make a real difference. And I sincerely hope we can go beyond party politics to help mould a genuinely effective strategy. As has become clear, social isolation has become a prevalent public health issue. We are increasingly independent and transient, we are living increasingly independent and transient lives and largely gone are the days of three generations living under the same roof and individuals staying in the same villages, towns and cities for their entire lives. More people than ever are going to university, moving away from their hometowns and setting up a new life away from parents. And instead of the career ladder, we now speak of the career jungle gym, where young people move from job to job as they connect the dots of an eclectic career path and increasingly technology has replaced face-to-face -face contact 
from catching up with our friends on WhatsApp to using self-service checkouts. We are more likely to be on our own, and whilst being alone doesn't always mean you're lonely, it's important that we account for this societal change. And further to this, we are becoming even more aware of how groups such as carers, young new mums, and those in the LGBT community, for example, are disproportionately affected, something that should be built into the strategy. Long-term cultural change is therefore key, and that's something that can be achieved through both government and individual action. I am pleased that the draft strategy picks up on the need to focus on grassroots action and letting communities lead, as I've been lucky enough to see firsthand some of the great initiatives that are out there. When I visited the food train last year, it was the wider benefits of that charity that the charity provided that struck me the most. Through delivering food shopping to people's homes, volunteers went above and beyond their core duties to provide the friendship and vital human contact we all need. In visiting Contact the Elderly, a charity that organises monthly tea parties for older people, some who may live alone, I realised just how simple yet effective volunteer efforts can be. At a tea party in Glasgow, I was pleasantly surprised by the mix of ages as volunteer drivers and guests came together, taking a few hours out of their day simply just to chat. And what these initiatives showed me was that simplicity can sometimes be key and that those volunteering got as much out of helping others as, they were, as those who were helping. And from examples in the media, it's also became apparent that thinking outside the box is increasingly effective at combating social isolation and loneliness. Only this week in the newspapers, we saw a story of a London student moving in with a 95-year-old pensioner in what has turned out to be an arrangement benefiting both of them, both financially and, more importantly, in providing that companionship. It's a simple idea that could be systematically promoted within universities or companies, perhaps, that have a lot of younger interns who can't afford city rental prices. These indeed feed into the premise that intergenerational work is important in creating connections, and to use a phrase coined by Age UK Scotland and the Mental Health Foundation, it's about treating older people as assets to the community. Many people were impressed, as was I, by the recent Channel 4 Age UK trial, where nursery-age kids set up a classroom in a retirement home in Bristol. And in the same vein, I'd like to put forward an idea of a pen pal system within some schools, whereby young people can write to older people who perhaps, because of living in rural settings, are hindered by the lack of transport and befriending services. We know that there are huge wider benefits to tackling this issue. Physical and mental health is intrinsically linked with loneliness. As well as it being thought that it increases the likelihood of mortality by 10%, there are proven links between loneliness and higher dementia rates for older people. And research has found that people who are lonely are more likely to have high blood pressure, poor sleep and depression. Evidence points to people reporting to GPs and A&Es when the root cause of their problem is loneliness. So I would like to see the Scottish Government being systematic in its approach to signpost appropriate support where we know lonely people might first seek help. And I appreciate the strategy's mention of social prescribing, but beyond research and its impact, I would like to know more about how social prescribing will become part and, part and parcel of the health service response to loneliness, something that will provide the foundation and structure to tie together the initiatives out there and promote them in a systematic way. The Royal College of GPs found that patients were more likely to make contact with a group if they received clear information. At the start of its impro links, Improving Links in Primary Care project, it found that 50% of patients accepted the recommendation of signposting to a local resource, but this has increased to 80% six months after the, project, the end of the project. In trial projects, such that in North Ayrshire and North Lanarkshire, whereby GPs in deprived areas refer patients to link workers to explain to them what services are available locally have shown to work very successfully. So as well as an update on how many of the 250 community link workers the Scottish Government committed to recruit by the end of the parliamentary session, how many have been recruited so far? I'd like to ask the Minister how we will set about creating a joined up approach using resources such as the Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations. And I'd also like to ask how it intends to monitor and select pilot projects in local communities which, which can be recommended as models to use elsewhere. I want also to make a final ask for the creation 
of a Scotland-specific National Day dedicated to this issue. We all have a responsibility to play in preventing social isolation and loneliness, but this would be supported by a national awareness of what's out there and what individuals can do in their communities can to make a difference. And a final point I'd like to make is the need again for a systematic assessment of how, of how any future strategy would work, something I have alluded to in my amendment. I don't, I don't wish for us just to mean well. I want us to do well, and for this, we need to find concrete ways of measuring and monitoring progress. And I appreciate the strategy does contain a draft framework, but this would be undoubtedly strengthened by referencing exactly how levels of loneliness and isolation will be measured, as well as a national indicator committing to reducing isolation and loneliness. To finish today, I would like to reiterate my support for the draft strategy as we look to build on the legacy of people like Joe Cox. This is an important step forward from the Scottish Government as we look to tackle an issue that is becoming more and more prevalent across our communities that we represent. And only by doing that will we give ourselves the best chance of succeeding in the longer term. Preventing social isolation and loneliness is the responsibility of us all. And I look forward to working together to build a strategy addressing this vital issue in the coming months. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call on Monica Lennon to speak to and move Amendment 9927.3 in her name. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to open today's debate for Scottish Labour because a national strategy to combat social isolation and loneliness is very welcome. Scottish Labour committed to establishing a national loneliness strategy in our 2016 manifesto. And we are fully committed to working with the Scottish Government in order to make sure it is a success. And I congratulate the Minister for her leadership on this issue so far. As the Minister said, social isolation and loneliness can affect any of us at any stage of our lives, which is why it is so important we develop this national strategy, which will look at how we can work collaboratively, both across government, parliament and indeed with external partners to combat this. And I'd like to thank the Minister and Annie Wells for their recognition of our, our friends Joe and Brendan Cox. I'd also like to thank the many organisations who have provided helpful briefings for today's debate, including, and I don't want to forget anyone, the Mental Health Foundation, Age Scotland, the Red Cross, the Cooperative Party, of which I should say I'm a member of, and Marie Curie and Voluntary Health Scotland. There is clear recognition across Civic Scotland that loneliness is a growing problem and it's in all of our interest to try and grapple with this. The Joe Cox Commission on Loneliness carried out a year-long study which found that 9 million people across the UK are lonely, with health consequences of £32 billion to the economy every year. And we've heard some of the evidence, including that loneliness can be as harmful to health as smoking up to 15 cigarettes a day. I find that quite hard to believe. So not only does it create a huge burden on our public service, it's an unacceptable social inequality which must be eradicated. And that's why my colleague David Stewart, who is our new Shadow Minister for Health, is closing the debate today because we see that need to work across our policy areas. This strategy is an opportunity to consider how government can show leadership, working with other partners, to consider how we can take preventative action, which reduces social isolation, yes, and by extension prevents people from experiencing loneliness where possible. We've heard that loneliness affects people of all ages. And whilst it's often thought of as a problem which affects older people, recent research from the Mental Health Foundation shows that loneliness is having a negative impact on the mental health of tens of thousands of young people too. And with 2018 being the year of the young person, and the government also committed to a strategy on child and adolescent mental health and wellbeing, in addition to the ongoing education governance review, I hope that this social isolation strategy will contain actions which reflect the work which is ongoing across the government in tackling this issue, specifically with regards to prioritising good mental health and providing access to school-based counselling at the heart of the education system. I welcome the commitment in the, the consultation that ultimately we want to let communities lead. And that's why I'm particularly struck by the sentiment in the Liberal Democrats' amendment, particularly on the role that people can play in, in placemaking. I think it's very timely, given the government's uh, planning bill is very much in, in everyone's minds. So I agree that 
change does happen from the ground up and tackling a, a complex problem like loneliness is not something that we can be can be solved by any one policy document or a directive from Edinburgh. So we agree that we all have to play our part in combating loneliness. And this is why the amendment in my name today uh, to the motion is on the importance that local government has to play in delivering community services. Local government is responsible for the delivery of many services which are vital to connecting people, whether that be day centres or social care services for older people, community transport links, social activities through access to community run leisure facilities or funding to local voluntary groups. So I think it's very important that we're honest about the challenges face facing all of these services and the impact that can have, particularly for older people. I fully agree with the sentiments in the draft strategy around the desire to empower communities and the important role the third sector has to play. But we can't have an honest conversation about how we will go about building uh, cohesion in our communities without acknowledging that public sector budgets are being squeezed and the knock-on impact of that on third sector organisations reduces their capacity to achieve this. Community organisations are well placed to tackle loneliness, but they are uh, at, at risk in places. Um, in terms of some of the, 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 the groups who are active, um, I've been thinking a lot about my own area in central Scotland, including South Lanarkshire. Um, LEAP, who is Lightburn Elderly Association Project, and if the minister's not had a chance to visit, I'm sure they would be pleased to, to host a visit. They specialise in reducing loneliness through befriending services to older people, but their budget, um, if South Lanarkshire like Council go ahead, is, will be slashed by 15%, and that's, that's £8,000, so that will have an impact. And in a previous debate on loneliness, last Clear uh, intervention. I, th I thank the member for taking the intervention, um, and I hear what she says about uh, the draft budget at South Lanarkshire Council. Will uh, Monica Lennon be encouraging her Labour colleagues on South Lanarkshire Council to engage with the current administration in uh, the draft budget and be putting forward their proposals? Monica Lennon. I thank Claire Hockey for her intervention. I had a meeting with um, Councillor David McLachlan, who leads the Labour Group last Friday, and I, I think he's had a meeting with Councillor John Ross, who is the leader. So I know that, that LEAP uh, are, are, are based in, in Claire Hockey's constituency, so she'll also be concerned about this potential cut of £8,000. And as I was saying, when we had a debate in loneliness last year, brought forward by my colleague uh, Rhoda Grant, um, at that time, I, I talked about the benefit of organisations like LEAP and how we can celebrate them. Um, COVID, another organisation who are based in South Lanarkshire, uh, provide befriending to young people. And I was a volunteer myself uh, when I was a student, so that wasn't yesterday. And I think Annie Wells's points about the intergenerational links, these are really important. There's, when I was a councillor um, in Hamilton in, in Whitehill, we had a, an annual intergenerational lunch where the young people came and they cooked the food and joined all the people who had the lunch together. I wasn't one of the older people, I think I was somewhere in the middle, but you get the, the theme and there was entertainment and it brought everyone together but these events are at risk if we don't invest in, in our local councils. Um, so I think what we're getting at here is it's not just one word, we do need appropriate funding and the third sector can't continue to fill in the gaps when core services are being cut back. In conclusion, presiding officer, I look forward to positively engaging with the minister as she takes forward the consultation on this important strategy. Social isolation is a complex issue. Solving it requires not only leadership from the government, but also active, constructive participation from all parties. We're fully committed to do that, and I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much. I now call on Alex Cole hamilton to speak to and move amendment 9927.3 in his name. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I'm very grateful to the Scottish Government for securing time to debate this issue and for the work they've already undertaken in the construct of the strategy we debate in part today. And if I may say so, the timing of this is very well pitched, coming as it does hot on the heels of the festive period, which whilst is a bright and joyous collection of days for most, serves as a counterpoint to amplify the isolation endured by many that nearly 80% of our adult population have experienced loneliness is a stark reminder of the human condition. We are a social animal, but so much about our modern life 
precludes meaningful social interaction. Considerable amount of our lives is spent in virtual worlds of our own creation now. And whilst we are most certainly active in many cases and informed, it is easy to spend much of that time in relative isolation. That isolation, as we've already heard, can impact massively on physical health, with a heightened risk of cardiovascular problems and dementia. Loneliness and mental ill health have a causal and self-sustaining relationship. And given that one quarter of all doctor's appointments have an underlying mental health issue at their root, this is a massive impact on the flow and functionality of our wider health service. Now, I don't mean to do our country down when I point to the fact that recent studies show that the vast majority of people in the communities that we all represent uh, do not recognize the, president, the presence of a community spirit where they live. Now, that's a worrying reality. It's something that we have seen underscored in the steady erosion of opportunities for and engagement in volunteering that we have heard a great deal about in the cross-party group on volunteering, which I am very proud uh, to convene. But I'm very grateful for the work of the Scottish Government in, in their efforts to draw volunteering through as a golden thread in all policy areas. How we construct the places where we live is key to turning all that around. Now, the built environment is so important to establishing meaningful social cohesion in our society and to reducing social isolation. But the pressures of housing demand and the business models of developers mean that all too often we are building dormitories and not communities. Planning by increment has been such that the expansion of our urban landscape has been undertaken without much thought at all of place. Thousands upon thousands of homes built, but with seldom a thought given to the creation of community hubs or spaces for communal activity for recreation. But it is also in the maintenance of our existing towns and cities where we exacerbate this problem of isolation still further. Now, I have told this chamber before of the time that I chaired the Scottish Order People's Assembly in this very room. And on asking them what their greatest concern was, I was shocked to learn that this was the fear of falling. Put simply, Deputy Presiding Officer, the fear of falling reduces the orbit of your world, especially at this time of year. As we know, the icy weather just before Christmas brought with it a spike in fracture cases presenting at our A&E departments. But if you're in your 80s, already frail, and don't have faith in the safety of pavements around you at the best of times, you're far more likely to stay at home. It's why, that I, it's why I sought and won support from this chamber for the introduction of a comprehensive national fall strategy. Now, I have been challenged at times by government members and ministers who point me to the 2014 falls framework. And I accept that that exists, but I say to them, it isn't working entirely. It doesn't stretch the provision of grit in our streets on icy days or handrails on our hills. It doesn't look to the even surfacing of our roads and pavements. And it doesn't propose the training of non-NHS public sector staff in how to respond and offer assistance when somebody does fall. Now, as such, we need to work with our Scottish local authority partners to devise a national fall strategy which looks at risk of falling in every aspect of life. Right. By so doing, we can reduce the strain on our NHS, improve social cohesion, and most importantly, increase the size of the social universe in which our most frail and infirm constituents currently exist. But, presiding officer, the loneliness is not, of course, the preserve of the elderly. Ask any young person who has endured an adverse childhood experience, and they will tell you how isolating trauma, attachment disorder, and loss can be yet we still don't properly identify these young people, let alone help them to fully recover. Now, a weight of evidence shows us that these events cause so much difficulty for them in later life, and loneliness is right up there. It's why Sir Harry Burns put this at the heart of his review on NHS targets. And it is a theme picked up by the Red Cross in the briefing that we all received in advance of this debate when they said that major life events which change someone's sense of self and their ability to connect uh, with other people should be seen as moments of particular risk. We must therefore act on this call from the former chief medical officer and use the data already available to us to identify trauma early on so that those vulnerable young people receive access to trauma recovery at an early stage. 
that can be delivered through the simple act of befriending, one of the most powerful antid antidotes to loneliness that there is for any age group. Yet we have seen many such services struggle with core funding in recent years. So I lend the support of these benches to calls from the third sector organisations for mainstream government uh, support and assistance to sustain them into the long term. But we must look for an appropriate policy response to this issue wherever we may find it. And to that end, I do welcome the appointment of the UK government, uh, by the UK government, of a Minister for Loneliness in Tracy Crouch. That is the silver lining to an otherwise calamitous reshuffle. But I would urge the Scottish Government to follow suit in that respect. Presiding Officer, people are often lonely in our communities in plain sight. They are all around us, but seldom known to us. Yet their eyes are turned to this chamber for solutions, and it is incumbent upon us not to let them down. So I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. Thank you. We now open. Sorry, we now move to, to the open debate. Six minute speeches, and I do have some time in hand, so I can allow extra time for interventions. And I call Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Jeremy Balfour. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Producing a national strategy to tackle social isolation and loneliness will surely help in the battle against feelings of isolation and loneliness that afflict so many people, feelings which impact on both physical and emotional well-being. I'm sure everyone in the Chamber today can agree that when they imagine a better Scotland, part of that vision features more connected communities which allow all members of society to build meaningful relationships and feel part of something greater. Most of us have probably experienced what the government's consultation refers to as transient loneliness, a temporary state sometimes provoked when contact with friends and family is limited. Unfortunately, once feelings of isolation take root, this can develop into a chronic condition which limits our ability to participate in society and enjoy life. And of course, many people feel embarrassed to share such feelings, even if indeed they have someone to share them with. Thanks to the work of organisations such as the Campaign to End Loneliness and the Joe Cox Commission on Loneliness, we are more aware than ever of the link between loneliness and poor mental health, with lonely individuals increasingly prone to depression and even suicide. Examining the findings of a review on social isolation and loneliness in Scotland, carried out by NHS Scotland last year, we see a worrying picture. 11% of adults in Scotland often feel lonely, 22% feel they don't have a strong sense of belonging to the local community, and a growing number of children at risk of social isolation because of poor peer support or bullying. I'm also convinced that our modern obsession with social media plays its part too, as research consistently indicates that the more time people spend online, the less they spend in the company of other human beings. So what can we as a parliament, as MSPs, as individuals do about this? Well, locally, Patricia Gibson MP and I have led a door-to-door -door campaign over the last two months to let constituents know the steps they can all take to reduce loneliness in our communities, providing information which includes contacts for organisations ranging from Age Scotland to Ayrshire Community Trust and its volunteering organisations to LGBT Youth Scotland. Nationally, in a bold step forward, Scotland is the first UK nation and one of the first in the world to develop a, st a national strategy to address this issue. Above all, local communities themselves are the key to identifying and protecting those at risk of becoming isolated, while government can foster an environment where these communities are empowered to design and implement their own initiatives that meet their own particular needs. Community initiatives can come in all shapes and sizes, and of course, any group which comes together to learn a new skill or share an old pastime helps build those vital connections which make us feel more rooted in our communities. Sometimes befriending can be the specific goal of an initiative, and sometimes it's just a happy consequence. An example of one such project exists in my constituency, Food Train North Ayrshire, which of course I raised FMQs today. Some members may already be familiar with the excellent work this charity does across Scotland. In North Ayrshire, the service provides weekly groceries to 172 older people through a network of 40 enthusiastic volunteers backed by full, two full-time employees. Not only does the food train provide a vital lifeline by delivering groceries to household and isolated older people, it also forms meaningful connections between the volunteers and those they serve. I'm happy to do so. John I Scott. I think uh, Kenny Gibson has taken an intervention. He mentions food train, which was also piloted in South Ayrshire, where uh, their pilot has now been suspended due to a lack of funding with the uh, SNP-led council there. Uh, I know he's going to be speaking to Cabinet Secretary about that. Will he also bring up uh, the loss of this service to my constituents in Ayr and Prestwick and Troon, please. Kenneth Gibson. Yeah, 
we actually had a brief discussion on this just after FMQs, and at the time I, I said I would be happy to speak to the Minister, and I'm certainly happy to do that uh, uh, with regard to uh, South Ayrshire just as well as uh, North Ayrshire. Um, and I would urge um, members across the uh, chamber to sign my motion on Food Train North Ayrshire, which is, as you will see, a completely non-partisan motion. Uh, the, the power, of course, of this kind of dependable relationship, um, where um, someone can go days at a time without company, but has someone who can visit them and give news and chat and ensure recipients are okay, cannot be underestimated. Um, however, uh, as the food train North Ayrshire is soon to be taken away by North Ayrshire Health and Social Care uh, Partnership, um, one, what, I certainly believe this decision should be reversed before serious harm is caused to the users who have come to rely upon its physical and emotional benefits. In this year of young people, it is especially important to remember that loneliness isn't just a problem limited to older members of society. In fact, a report by the Mental Health Foundation in 2010 found loneliness was most common between the ages of 18 and 34. Support for this age group has been deemed lacking by many campaigners, as they are mostly too old to access youth services and too young for initiatives aimed at younger people. And I think Monica Lennon uh, touched on that in her own speech. In particular, young disabled people, LGBT teens and those from ethnic minority backgrounds are more likely to experience social isolation. Chronic and persistent bullying can lead to intense loneliness, reduced self-esteem and social anxiety in later life. The new strategy ties in with the recently published national approach to anti-bullying and encourages an intergenerational approach to building connected communities. After all, every generation can learn from those that came before, and I'm sure Scotland's young people could teach us a few things or two. Certainly in IT, that's for sure. Presenting officer, there's no denying that austerity is forcing individuals and families into poverty across the UK. And the Institute for Fiscal Studies estimates that cuts in welfare spending will lead to a 10% reduction in the incomes of the poorest 20% of working families. Meanwhile, an additional 1 million children will be in relative poverty in the UK in 2020 as a direct result of cuts imposed since 2013. The Scottish Government is working hard to mitigate these cuts and this strategy reaffirms its commitment to tackling poverty and inequality. However, in looking at both the causes and consequences of social isolation, there are several core areas where the Scottish Government can act. For example, recent studies have shown a definitive li link between socio-economic status and social isolation, with those living in poverty increasingly likely to experience feelings of loneliness. Over the course of this consultation, indeed after this strategy is finalised, I look forward to ongoing collaboration between the Scottish Government, Health and Social Care Partnership, schools, the third sector, grassroots community organisations and others to make, this goal, uh, make the goals outlined a reality. Together, I'm confident that, that we can begin to turn the tide of the loneliness epidemic here in Scotland and serve as an example to nations around the world. I call Jeremy Balfour to be followed by Ruth Maguire. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. As the classic song Simon and Garfunkel, I am a rock, the chorus says, I am a rock, I am an island. But the song ends with the words, but a rock feels no pain, and an island never cries. Or as the good book in Genesis tells us, God said it was not good for man to be alone. All of us are aware that we are made for relationship. We need to interact with other human beings because without that interaction, we end with social, physical, and mental issues. I suspect for too long in our society and in Western Europe, Loneliness has not been taken as a serious issue. But yet, as we look at the fact, 79% of adults in Scotland have experienced loneliness. 17% of people in Scotland are always or often lonely. That means nearly one million Scots adults are feeling lonely at some point. Loneliness can, can occur to many different individuals. Older people stuck at home, mums and dads bringing up their children who lack adult company, and all age groups due to the breakdown of traditional society. We have seen over the last probably 50 years a breakdown in our culture of community, volunteering, and neighbourhoods. It's interesting, one of my assistants was saying to me today that she knows one family only in her street. Yet her mother on Hogmanay had the whole street in 
and parties until 4 a.m. in the morning. And I think there is something there about a generational difference and change. Now that has a lot to do with the way that we live and work. People are working longer hours. The community isn't sometimes found in the place that they sleep. Technology is both a blessing and a curse. I'm personally, although a Facebook fan, not convinced that it's an alternative to a good chat with somebody in a pub or coffee shop. In fact, quite the opposite is the case. I know a number of my friends who say to me, I'm coming off Facebook because I'm going through a difficult time. Facebook is about cats and dogs and happy faces and Myrtle talking about himself. <laughs> Those with disability can be isolated. And as we've heard, it is in different areas and different communities. But perhaps, perhaps older people and those with disability, either through com communication, because they find it difficult to speak and build relationship, because of loneliness, because they're stuck in a house due to being scared to go into a crowd or getting out. But as um, Alex Cohamity pointed out, there are things that we can do locally and nationally. Again, if I can just give an example from this Tuesday. Uh, where I stay, we had snow and ice. Now, the streets where the buses ran were absolutely fine and clear. But that was about 500 yards, 600 yards from my door. Without help due to slipping on ice, I couldn't get to that bus to get to work. And I do think local authorities have to look again at what roads do we grit and what pavements do we grit. Too often we have roads being gritted, but never pavements, which means for can be for weeks, if not, and sometimes months, older people and disabled people are left in their houses and are isolated. One GP said to me recently, that if he could deal with isolation amongst his older patients, he could cut a third of the prescriptions that he writes. There is a medical cost here as well. So I think there are things we can do. There are examples here within Edinburgh, which I think are really positive. A Vintage Vibes is a charity that's been going for a fairly short time, which seeks to bring older and younger people together not just for a younger person to visit somebody in their house, but to go out to the cinema, to go shopping, to socialise together. And that must be surely a good thing that we have intergenerational uh, uh, talking to people and finding out experience. So I think we need to see uh, local authorities, local communities, voluntary sectors, national government all playing their part. But finally, the heart feels a responsibility on all of us as well. How well do I know my neighbours? How well do I know the older person who lives a few doors along from me? Can I take time out of my schedule just to pop in and see that they're OK or do something for them? So yes, I welcome this strategy. I think it is a, a very helpful document. I welcome the UK announcing a minister but I suspect the only way we will actually change this is when you and I, the rest of us, all of us, play our part. Thank you. I call Ruth Maguire to be followed by Mark Griffin. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, there's no doubt to me that social isolation can have a significant impact on a person's health and well-being and on their ability to recover from those um, emotional or physical setbacks or bumps along the road that, that life throws at us. Social isolation and loneliness can affect anyone at any stage of life, but today I'd like to talk about um, some older women in my constituency and on the importance of a service called Food Train to them, a service which is being withdrawn, but which the community, I'm sure, will come together to fight to save. Sheila. Alderson is from Irvine and she wrote of her sadness at the decision announced last week, saying, Food Train is more than a shopping service, it's an interaction as well. 
I get a good blether when I phone in my shopping order on a Monday, and we have a blether when they come to deliver my shopping as well. It breaks the week for me. They're friendly folk. They always ask how I'm doing. Food Train also gives Sheila the freedom and flexibility to do her own shopping um, when she's up to it. If the weather's good, she can catch the bus to the local, sur uh, local, local supermarket. But if the weather's bad or she's not feeling up to it, she can order the food she needs from Food Train. This lets her stay in her own home. And by doing her own shopping, she can do what she enjoys, which is cooking fresh food for herself. The end of Food Train means the end of this freedom of being in her own home in her community. 85-year-old Rosina Donnelly, also from Irvine, um, cares for her husband who has dementia. In advance of today's debate, she wrote to me describing the announcement as a bombshell and food train volunteers as the most wonderful caring people she's ever come across, saying that she knows she can trust them to come into her home. To quote Rosina directly, she said, Without a single doubt in my mind, Food Train was the best thing North Ayrshire Council, Council did for pensioners, making sure we could feed ourselves with a very trustworthy and reliable workforce. Food Train is our lifeline. If we can't feed ourselves, the next step is a care home, and that's expensive, and no one wants to end their lifetime out of their own home if it's at all possible to remain there. Presiding officer, I appreciate that local authorities and health and social care partnerships have very challenging, difficult decisions to make under times of considerable economic pressure. But in reaching these decisions, proper impact and risk assessments have to be done about ending services, and people on the front line receiving them need to be consulted. In the case of Food Train, my more vulnerable constituents, older people who rely on the service, their opinion wasn't sought in making the decision, and that's simply unacceptable. I will do all I can to support the Save Our Service campaign to get this decision reversed, and I would encourage any other West of Scotland MSPs who have not signed the petition or Kenneth Gibson's um, motion to do so and to get involved and to talk to the people in their constituent, their part of the, the, the patch that are affected. Um, of course, tackling social isolation and loneliness is not just about services, it's about wider societal change that we can all be part of by doing our own wee bit. As the draft strategy makes clear, this can be as simple as being more kind in our day-to-day -day lives. Something that's been identified is going a long way to reducing social isolation amongst people of all ages and stages of life. I was really touched to see one primary school's approach to encouraging kindness on social media last week. The outline of one pupil is drawn on a big sheet of paper and the rest of the class write down reasons why we love and then all of the other children have to, have to write something positive about their wee pal from the class. Last week's included the following inspiring gems. He respects the whole class and our feelings. He never leaves anyone out. And my personal favourite, it's like he has a hundred hearts and they're all good. What a beautiful, beautiful thing and something we could probably all learn from in this chamber now and again. Um, I hope North Ayrshire Health and Social Care Partnership can find it in their hearts to save North Ayrshire Food Train. Our older people really rely on it and it does make a difference. I'll close there, Presiding Officer. A wee change to what I said before. We'll have Graham Day followed by Mark Griffin. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and uh, follow that. Um, Social isolation is undoubtedly a scourge of modern day living as we've supposedly moved on as a society. Too many of our citizens have in this regard been left behind. Many of us have become too self-focused, interested in our immediate family perhaps, but in a meaningful sense, little beyond that. I know I have in the past been guilty of that myself. And presiding officer, that realization only hit me as a consequence of a comment made in the course of engaging with one of a number of organizations in my constituency that are making a concerted effort to address this situation. In relation to social isolation and loneliness amongst the elderly and the lack of appreciation of this, they pointed to an everyday situation many of us were being confronted by, popping into the supermarket for a few essential items, in a rush as we always are, stood in the queue, becoming increasingly agitated as the older person being served 
uh, chats to the checkout operator about nothing much, holding the rest of us up. I bet many of us in the chamber have been there. Maybe thought, oh, come on, hurry up. But here's a much more worthy thought. What about reflecting on whether that old person is enjoying the only interaction with another human being they'll have that day, or maybe in the course of a few days? Is it really such a hardship for the rest of us to wait another minute or two before getting on with our lives? Surely all of us could make that small and seemingly insignificant contribution towards creating a connected Scotland, tackling social isolation and loneliness, and building stronger communities, the aspiration of today's debate. I'm fortunate to represent a part of Scotland where considerable structured community-led and delivered effort is going on to addressing loneliness and isolation amongst the elderly, which perhaps leaves us well placed to take forward what the Scottish Government aims to around having people and communities having a central role in building and maintaining social connections with, with those who may be socially isolated. But in highlighting some of that work, I would acknowledge that we're not there yet in Angus South because much of this is focused in the towns and isolation and loneliness may well be even more acute in more rural parts. Uh, but this is about communities supporting its members. Uh, uh, but I think where, where there is perhaps a role for government is in facilitating the delivery of more comprehensive networks and indeed ensuring that GP, social work and other agencies are proactively signposting anyone they identify as being socially isolated to the support that can be provided. There are two highly successful befriending networks in my constituency, one in Carnoustie, the other in Monty Faith. Having started up in 2011 with a client roster of six people, Carnoustie Befrienders now has 22 volunteers making regular visits to 30 people in the town and surrounding villages who sadly don't have anyone or at least anyone nearby. Referrals come from GPs, social work, neighbours and family members. And I note that because in my experience that isn't certainly in the case of GPs an absolute given. A little further down the Angus coastline and you reach Money Feath with the brilliant Money Feath befriending scheme. Currently has over 40 clients matched with uh, adult befrienders. Um, but what's particularly pleasing about the Money Feath group is the involvement of pupils from the local high school. And this year of young people, I want to applaud the work that Money Feath befriending scheme is doing with their six pupils, with the assistance of the deputy head teacher, Kathleen Ritchie. These people support folk in care homes, either be by being partnered with one of the residents or by helping with group uh, group activities. Incidentally, the Money Feath scheme works out of the local GP practice, a good example of collaborative and joined up working. Another group which is seeking to tackle the issue of social uh, isolation in my constituency is Contact the Elderly. The organisation has volunteer, uh, volunteers who provide monthly Sunday afternoon tea parties. Why Sunday? It seems that, that Sunday has been identified as the loneliest day of the week. Um, now, nationally, Contact the Elderly has been operating for 52 years, and in Angus South, those tea parties are being held in Carnoustie and the more rural setting of Teeling. Uh, a survey conducted... Absolutely. Emma Harper. Thank you. Thank you, Graeme Day, for taking my intervention. Does he agree that we should recognise the fantastic work that the National R Rural Mental Health Forum has undertaken with respect to the unique challenges presented by rural isolation as you're talking about all these communities that are rural in his own constituency. Graham Day. Uh, thank you. Absolutely. I, I'm aware of the significant work that Emma Harper refers to and actually looking forward to hearing more about it when I meet uh, our former parliamentary colleague Jim Hume uh, who's been leading on this uh, next week. Um, a survey conducted by uh, Contact the Elderly found that 90% of guests said they'd made friends with volunteers and 81% had made friends with other guests. That sounds like a pretty good success rate to me. Sitting alongside all of this and also playing a vital role in tackling isolation, as, as the Minister rightly pointed out, are men's sheds. There are three in my constituency, in Kirrimuir, Arbroath and Carnoustie and Monty Feath. Having visited the latter two, I know of the great benefits they provide. For many men, suggesting to them meeting up with a friend for a coffee might not appeal but combine that with an activity and you're more likely to get a positive uh, reaction from them. Joining one has been shown to lead to users living healthier, happier and more connected lives. And in noting the work of the groups I've highlighted, let me acknowledge the shortcomings. These schemes do not cover every part of my constituency and certainly not every rural nook and cranny. And whilst there is work being done to deliver a pan-Angus befriending service, we still some way to go. So I we very much welcome this debate and the consultation, this is a conversation we absolutely need to have. In conclusion, President Officer, let me of course recognise that whilst I've focused my contribution on efforts being made to tackle social isolation amongst the elderly, this problem impacts many, many other groups of all ages, one of which would be children with additional support needs and indeed their parents. And in this regard, I think there's perhaps an overlap between 
what this strategy sets out to achieve and the current wider consideration of how we best meet the needs of ASN youngsters. And I wonder if the Minister, uh, in closing, might comment on, on that particular issue. Presiding Officer. We do still have a bit of time in hand, and I call Mark Griffin to be for, followed by Alison Johnson. Thank you, President Officer. We support the launch of the draft strategy this week and are pleased that Scotland has taken the lead in tackling loneliness. The Minister has delivered on something that Labour and Government would have too, and I hope that we can work together to refine and execute the strategy. And I welcome the Minister's constructive comments regarding the, the shared responsibility that we all have. Yesterday, the UK government announced there would be a minister to tackle loneliness. So it, it's reassuring that this is one area where all parties across the chamber and across parliaments are now taking action to tackle this growing social and public health problem. Now, before she was murdered in 2016, Jo Cox's commission on loneliness led the way in tackling the issue and as her husband Brendan said yesterday, we should be thankful that even though she's not here, her work is still making the world a better place. Now my, my colleagues, Rachel Reeves and Seema Kennedy, who now chair the commission, have highlighted just how extensive loneliness is across the UK. As Monica Lennon said, that they, they found that nine million people in the UK are lonely, the consequence of which costs the, the economy £32 billion every year. And the, the Minister's draft strategy highlights equally worrying trends in Scotland. One in ten feel lonely often, three in ten calls to Silverline Scotland and the National LGBT Helpline were about loneliness and eight in ten people caring for their loved ones have felt lonely. Now, these trends undoubtedly fill us with concern, but they should drive us to tackle the root causes. And across government, there are solutions in social security, housing and local government, but also in health, uh, mental and public, and we can help prevent loneliness, spot it and intervene. I'm particularly interested in the emphasis that the draft strategy places on the role of community. It is of course, our relationships with neighbours, loved ones and the people we see every day, which can help make sure that contact meets our social needs. And studies uh, suggest that, that social isolation can also interact with poverty and can lead to feelings of loneliness. Then we need to tackle that poverty that plagues communities so that communities themselves can then to actually tackle that loneliness. And there, there is, of course, an important question about we, how we in the Chamber aid those connections. And surely we've got the, the power to ensure services are in place to help communities make those connections or create a setting so we can reach out to someone. Like, as Rachel Reeves has said, um, when the, the culture and the communities that once connected us to one another disappear, we can be left feeling abandoned and cut off from society. Now that's why we're asking Parliament to recognise the importance of community services that tackle loneliness and acknowledge that austerity driven budget cuts to local authorities reduce their capacity to do that. In North Lanarkshire, the, the likes of Cumbernauld Action for Care of the Elderly and Voluntary Action North Lanarkshire are doing great work to help tackle loneliness while the suicide prevention campaign one with NHS Lanarkshire, Albion Rovers, Motherwell, Airdrie and Clyde Football Clubs is award-winning. But the Finance Secretary's budget settlement could make that work harder in the very near future. The Council has had to cut £200 million from services in the past decade, while the, the decision on the integrated joint board funding for the year ahead uh, is imminent. President Officer, before I close, I wanted to pick up on a point I had touched on before that eight in 10 people caring for loved ones have felt lonely. In two weeks, we'll begin stage two consideration of the social security bill. The people of Scotland will see its parliament use new powers to create our own system to change the lives 
of disabled people and their carers, tackle poverty and reinforce the safety net. Now, with over 30% of working age Glaswegians who are disabled or unable to work, experiencing loneliness and carers feeling increasingly lonely, um, I hope that the Minister and I can discuss how the bill begins to tackle that. A contact report in 2011, Forgotten Families, said how disability in a family can cause loneliness through a combination of financial, emotional and practical pressures. Stigma and lack of services prevents families from being integrated while low income compounds that, that freedom to get out and about. The report highlights how families struggle to find or access the support of other families in their situation, all the while trying to do by the best by their children uh, and loved ones. I hope that the, the Minister will accept that her proposed amendment, her proposed amendment to uprate certain benefits could have afforded carers that same assurance. I think that would match the government's commitment to annual uprating of carers' allowance in line with inflation. And I hope that the Minister and I can discuss a further amendment I'm working on to, to better reflect that policy. Thank you, President Officer. May I have Alison Johnson to be followed by Sandra White. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. There's a great deal of consensus in the Chamber this afternoon on this issue. I even agree, I think, entirely with Jeremy Balfour, particularly regarding Murdo Fraser and Facebook. Um, uh, and I agree, too, with Mark Griffin when you know, he touches on the fact that this is an area that is cross-cutting. You know, education impacts, housing impacts, planning impacts, transport policy impacts. So I'm really glad that we're debating this important issue today and that the government is developing a focus on reducing both social isolation and loneliness. While it's clear that people and communities themselves have an important role in this, the government's motion today and consultation document are certainly clear that it too has an important role in creating the conditions for change and highlights a number of key areas, such as planning and transport, which are central to creating communities which connect people. And I welcome the focus on this in the Lib Dem Amendment too, because this is fundamental. We can't build thriving communities which make varied social interaction a normal part of everyday life if we continue to design around the car. So we need to make public transport more accessible, invest more in walking and cycling, it's really vital to creating a community that people feel they're part of. I live in Edinburgh, so I you know, experience the benefits of a bus service that's managed locally for public benefit, but people in other parts of Scotland aren't so lucky. You know, Glasgow first bus have hiked children's bus fares by 40%, try to increase fares for unemployed people. I mean, this journey to the bus stop, on my way to the bus stop in the morning, I, I might have a neighbour shouting at me, saw you on telly last night, didn't agree with a word you said, mind. Um, <laughs> Uh, as my daughter looks around um, askance. Or I moved house a couple of years ago and one of the people I met at the bus stop gave me a card saying, I hope you meet some good bus stop people <laughs> when you're further up the road. These little connections are really, really important. And I think that's why public transport, active travel are so important to invest in. So I welcome the document that restates that the government's committed to the National Concessionary Travel Scheme. But I think as a parliament, we need to get serious about re-regulating re our buses, improving that concessionary travel offer so that it includes young people and people on low incomes. As we all acknowledge, social isolation and loneliness really do affect people at all ages and stages of life and manifest itself in different ways. I'm deeply concerned that loneliness is increasing. I see signs of this every day in my own work. Sometimes reaching out for an assistance with a practical problem is also a way of reaching out for contact, for a chat, for the feeling that somebody somewhere is on your side, that somebody somewhere knows you exist. My staff and I are aware of increased phone calls from constituents who seem to have little other social contact, who call us regularly. We now recognise their, their voices. You know, we do all that we can to help. But it is my experience that more and more constituents are turning to us in severe emotional distress, perhaps struggling with a mental health condition. And we will, of course, do all that we can to help. I don't know if any of you, after the, the late news last night, saw a clip. There was a 71-year-old woman, I believe. Um, she was on the late national news, and she was sharing her experience with a befriending 
service. You know, my mum's 71. I watched that. If, if you can watch that and, you know, not feel slightly choked that she was choked when she was speaking about how much she looks forward to one phone call a week that is arranged for her by a service. Um, and I don't know if you've seen the Age UK video just before Christmas, John's story. Do watch it. I think it's really heartening that we're discussing this. It's now on mainstream media. We do have people like Joe and Brendan Cox to thank for that. We heard um, Tony Giuliano of the Mental Health Foundation speaking articulately um, on television last night. So this is, you know, it's becoming part of our national discussion, but it is becoming part of mainstream media. And I think that can only be a really good thing. Um, Labour's amendment makes clear that community services are crucial. The consultation document runs through a long list of individual initiatives and sources of funding which are welcome, like the Public Library Improvement Fund, but we must protect what we have on a local basis. The consultation document states there must be good access to appropriate community facilities and places to meet, so we have to protect local authority budgets. That's fundamental. And while many local services have turned to co-location, that can sometimes be driven by pressure on budgets, so we have to make sure that people have got a wide range of community services and facilities to choose from. And I welcome um, Jeremy Balfour's highlighting of vintage vibes. Um, they say that good company never gets old. You can go and <laughs> gather and giggle. You can join the stroll patrol if you fancy a walk. And if singing's your thing, well, there's vintage vocals. Um, so, you, you know, there are many organisations who are, are really working hard to combat loneliness and social isolation. In volunteering in athletics myself, I was, I was well aware I w worked with three coaches who had all suffered bereavements. And that getting out down to the track, meeting people of all ages, um, you know, helping them attain their athletic ambitions, doing something they were passionate about, I could see the difference it made to those individuals' lives. So making it affordable and possible for those who want to volunteer to do so is incredibly important. Um, and as well as considering the social fabric of our towns, cities and rural areas, how we design our built environment and travel infrastructure, we've got to ask hard questions about how loneliness and social isolation relate to a culture that has become increasingly individualistic over past decades. There is a political health uh, dimension to this. As the Mental Health Foundation point out, our, si our society prides itself on self-reliance. And it makes it really difficult for people to own up to feeling lonely. It stops them talking about it or reaching out for help. So I welcome the government's acknowledgement that employers and businesses have a vital role to play here too. People in Scotland and the UK work some of the longest hours in Europe. It keeps us away from our friends, families, communities. So let's support flexible working. Let's be more open to part-time work. And let's ensure that workload priorities aren't isolating people because you know, we have to work hard if we want to build a more connected society. We've got to place greater value on protecting people's time away from work if we want this change to happen. Um, presiding officer, I will leave it there, but I look forward to working with colleagues to build that more socially connected, less lonely Scotland. Thank you. Sandra White, to be followed by John Scott. Thank you very much, President Officer. Before I get into the, the body of the speech, I'd just like to pick up on something that Kenny Gibson and Alison Johnson raised there as well. Whilst predominantly loneliness does affect older people, it certainly can affect all ages. And I remember uh, being on the Equal Opportunities Committee when we were doing the investigation. We did a, a phone-in uh, on the radio and we had a number of young people and one young professional uh, man phoned in which really stuck with me basically his um, personal life had fell apart but he felt he couldn't tell anyone in his work so he would go to his work and he would just go home and sit in the house so i think it's important that we look at that as well that other people are that i know we're you know predominantly talking about the older people because percentage wise it does affect them but you need to remember it can affect everyone and it's much much harder sometimes if you're younger to speak to your peers uh, about the situation you, you have found yourself in. Um, thank you for indulging me in that particular one as well. Uh, President officer, as previous Deputy Convener of the Equal Opportunities uh, Committee, I am really pleased to be speaking in this debate and I'm actually very proud that the Scottish Government has launched this consultation on loneliness and isolation uh, following on from the recommendations of the Equal Opportunities Committee, as the Minister has already mentioned. And uh, also note a comment in the consultation document 
in reference to the committee's recommendations, and it says, how are we doing? Uh, and I must say, I think I, I'm being honest in saying this, I'm going to say that uh, having read the report, I'd say I think you're doing pretty well when I look at what the recommendations are and how many have actually been enacted and how, are, how many are ongoing as well. I will, of course, keep a, a watching brief uh, as the strategy makes its way through Parliament, and I know that not just me, but others will certainly be looking at that. But I do thank um, the, the Minister and the Scottish Government for picking up on that, the work that was done during uh, that time, and uh, Margaret, the convener, uh, did a fantastic job uh, as well. Uh, presiding officer, the briefing from Mental Health Foundation and Age Scotland raises some very important issues, and in particular the fact that a quarter of uh, Scottish adults 65 years and over experience depression when they are lonely, and they have listed 12 recommendations. You're pleased to see I'm not going to read all of the recommendations out. Some have already been mentioned, but I'll pick up on a couple of them. I think this one had been mentioned in Investment in Community Services. I think Monica Lennon raised that particular part, and I think that's really important, not just for keeping people out of hospital, but community services can give people a much better life and you know combat loneliness as well. And uh, placing social prescribing front and centre in primary care, I think Annie Wells had raised that. And I know that is part and parcel of the deep end practices, and it's also been mentioned in the strategy as well. It's a very, very important one too. Tackling poverty and inequality has also been mentioned. Now, this is really important. People don't, don't seem to realise if you have no money, you can't go out. And if you have no money, you can't heat your home. And a number of older people, uh, you know, experience that. So I think it's really important to tackle poverty and inequality in later life. And it actually marries into, I think it's a recommendation 11, social inclusion for ethnic minority older people, including asylum seekers and refugees. Because sometimes, you know, you come in for a certain ethnic minority, it's much harder to become involved. And I think we really need to put particular emphasis on that to get people from minority, uh, ethnic minority more involved, but also the fact that sometimes they are living in uh, poverty as well and they're too proud to perhaps say that too. So I think that, you know, it's an excellent uh, piece of work as well. Age Scotland's briefing on the uh, mentions that triggers for loneliness Bereavement, absolutely. Moving home, sometimes far away from your family. Children moving away, I think that's already been mentioned as well. And retirement, that's a really important one. Evidence we took in our committee uh, basically showed that most men are the ones who suffer very much so from retirement because they've had this group of friends and they no longer sometimes have anything to get up for in the morning. Uh, so that's why I think, and I know Graeme Day had mentioned it and others, men's sheds have become so important for men who have retirement. They, they can go along there and they feel as though they're sometimes they're going to their work. That was certainly the evidence that we, we had in a, as well. And there's so many initiatives that are important. In my Kelvin constituency, like other uh, members who have excellent uh, initiatives, we have GOTBA, Glasgow People's Welfare Association, fantastic works throughout Glasgow, friendship club such as that in town head, line dancing, we've got the party pluckers. I've always got to be careful when I mention that. A group of older people that play the banjo, uh, art classes, desi I always think I'm glad I don't come from Falkirk when I'm saying that, but, <laughs> but uh, we have designated walks, uh, many, many more that say in, involved in that as well. But one of the areas I wanted to pick up, and it's actually in the strategy as well, is the community libraries. They have a really important part to play, and there's a real opportunity to sort of a wide in their remit, I think, and a quote with, which is in the consultation strategy, which is from Hill Head Library, and I know the people that work in the library, it's in my constituency, they said the majority of what we do is custom-led service, but in a bigger sense, some of these people have nobody else to talk to, so they come in here, which is nice, they feel comfortable enough to come in and chat. So I think the community libraries have a lot to do. And before I just finish up, we have got a fantastic new initiative in my constituency. It's called Weekday Wow Factor. You may have seen it on the TV. I took part in it. They take, believe it or not, older people zip sliding. Uh, they, and they absolutely love it. They absolutely love it. I'm, I'm too frightened to go up there, but they, they go. Uh, they do trips down the Waverley, and they have weekly discos. Now, if you've seen the joy, on the, and they take people in who come in with their carers, people in wheelchairs, older people, they've got more energy than I have, and the joy in these people's faces, because it brings them back to a time when 
perhaps they were younger, uh, they were just married, had children, whatever it may be, but the recognition in their face, it's absolutely wonderful. So well done, weekday wow factor. And you know, it's in a nightclub, but it's in the afternoon, sorry, it's not at night time. It's in the <laughs> afternoons. But you know, the DJ and the, the, the people who run the nightclub give of their time free to let the people to come in. Carers bring people with wheelchairs, people with disabilities, and otherwise. And it's a fantastic day. So you want to get a day out at a nightclub from one o'clock to three and party, please get in touch and I'll, I'll take you along to the weekday wow factor. There's loads and loads of things out there, but we've got to make sure we let people access it. Thank you very much, President Officer. <laughs> I think we should bring the wow factor in here. <laughs> and uh, I call John Scott to be followed by Gail Ross. Presiding officer, I think we've already got the wow factor in here with yourself and Sandra White. <laughs> I may take a little extra time. Um, presiding officer, can I begin by welcoming this debate to be today and the many positive contributions made thus far? Can I also welcome the last Equal Opportunities Committee's hard work on this subject? and also the government report of Connected Scotland, which is a good piece of work and clearly defines what needs to be done. And can I also, like others, welcome Tracy Crouch's appointment as the UK Minister for Loneliness, taking forward the good work of Joe Cox. So let me start with the report. And I think Jean Freeman, in her introduction, identified developing the principle of kindness as vitally important, and I could not agree with her more. In our own different ways, we are all here to improve the lives of our own special constituents. And for me, kindness, delivered on a daily basis, is one very practical way of endeavouring to make life better for others. As we all know, loneliness and social isolation is a growing problem. For me, and for me, picking up the phone to speak to a constituent who has a problem sometimes helps solve a problem in itself a problem too often caused by loneliness and isolation and an inability to deal with their problem brought about by not having someone to turn to. And developing this theme of kindness, I believe it is something we in Ayrshire do well, and particularly in South Ayrshire, which I know best. And as Burns suggested, gently scan thy fellow man, gentler still, sister woman, Sandra. Because I am immensely proud of the strength of our close-knit and caring communities in Eyre, Prestwick and Troon and surrounding towns and villages. And while I have no wish to appear complacent and perfectly well understand that much more can, could and should be done, I wish to commend to Parliament the good work of some organisations in my constituency that work daily to reduce the impact of loneliness and social isolation. Opportunities in retirement in Eyre with 1,400 members as well as OIR and Troon, create communities with a huge range of clubs, different, different activities taking place daily, from photography groups to chess to hill walking. And I'd be happy to discuss the OIR model with the Minister if she's not already aware of it. Voluntary Action South Ayrshire, VASA, supports many of our social enterprises as well as organising community events, one of which I attended before Christmas in Ayr Town Hall. Several befriending groups support our communities, as does Dementia Friendly Prestwick and Troon. And this Dementia Friendly Town model could easily be rolled out, not just in Ayrshire, but also across Scotland. Our Rotary Clubs of Ayr, Prestwick and Troon all do huge amounts of charity work, and I have to declare an interest as a member of Ayr Rotary Club. And these are just a few of the many similar organisations in my constituency which, to be frank, give people a reason to get out of their bed in the morning to go and either help with on a voluntary basis or benefit from the contact and services these various different groups and others like them provide. Coffee mornings on Saturday morning can be the highlight of a Saturday for some. And our churches, often overlooked as community builders, are great meeting places with Troon Old Parish Church holding a coffee morning every Saturday morning of the year and supported by its very own and very special group of people and not often enough by me. Five to 600 people attend St. Columbus Church in Ayr every Sunday 
to enjoy and benefit from the sense of community created by our Minister Fraser Aiken. So, Presiding Officer, I know from a lifetime of community involvement, both in rural and urban Scotland, of the problem we can and have all defined in our different ways this afternoon. I also know that it's not a new problem. One only has to think back 100 years to 1918, to the lifetime of loneliness and isolation so many women were consi consigned to after the loss of husbands, fiancés, fathers and brothers after the Great War. Similar, the very real losses and the hardships sustained by the Clydebank community after the Second World War. And I draw attention to these times to emphasise loneliness and social isolation and its different causes is not a new problem. And sadly, it has had to be faced and addressed before. So in that regard, presiding officer, the good news is the problem has long since been recognised and we now have an opportunity to build on the caring and voluntary infrastructure already in place. <coughs> with many fit and active people of my age already retired but looking for worthwhile engagement within their community, there is a huge opportunity for developing an even larger voluntary caring sector through a variety of models, but particularly the social enterprise model. The food train was an initiative that was piloted in South Ayrshire as well as North Ayrshire, but subsequently became unaffordable in South Ayrshire and now apparently in North Ayrshire as well, from Kenny Gibson's question to the First Minister this morning. And it was exemplary in the frontline light touch help it delivered to those whom they looked after. Rural isolation is also a growing problem with the new drink driving laws, the law of unintended consequence almost, but now deterring country people from going to the local pub for even one drink. Rural bus services are in decline too, and winter weather makes the problem worse as well, particularly for the elderly. And of course, there's a growing problem of loneliness and social isolation, as others have said, driven by mental health issues, driven um, by fuel poverty, <coughs> to be found in the deaf-blind communities, and too much of which goes unreported and unnoticed, and some of which is self-inflicted. <coughs> And here I speak of social media, which in my view is growing in its importance and its contribution to loneliness and social isolation, as well as mental health issues in the young. Too much time spent on Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, etc., turns social media into anti-social media, as conversational and inter social interactional skills are no longer to be learned or developed, as young people often can only communicate through one of the above platforms. A text message is no substitute for a phone call. The constant need to check a screen by ourselves, probably everyone here in the moment is on a screen one sort of another, by our work colleagues, by our children, by our grandchildren, is already affecting the evolution of our species and not necessarily in a good way. The day may yet dawn when class actions might be brought against these companies these internet providers with the long-term effects of internet damage to mental health and well-being as well as physical health are realized and evaluated and Kenny Gibson referred to this and to sur my surprise almost everyone has else has referred to it as well however I digress and this is a topic for another day and today I would encourage the minister to not just note these two reports but start making plans of action as to what is to be done the government will have our support tonight on this motion and our support in future in this area of work. And the sooner we get started, the better. Presiding officer. Thank you, Mr. Scott. Can I say to members, there is time to digress. And Mr. Scott, I'm sure everyone was devotedly listening to your speech and not diverted and looking at screens. Um, I now call um, Gail Ross to be followed by Alec Rowley. Thank you, President Officer. I would like to also um, put my thanks on record to the Scottish Government for bringing this debate on such an important issue today. Um, the draft strategy, the launch of the consultation, the decision to include loneliness and social isolation in the Fairer Scotland Action Plan, to set aside funds and to hold this debate today, show that this issue is finally something that we can, should and must do something about. And I would like to thank the Minister for detailing what has already been done. I would also like to commend the Scottish Government's Rural Division's recent campaign, Don't Wrap Up This Christmas, which aims to tackle uh, loneliness and mental health issues in rural areas. 
Loneliness is a blight not solely experienced by the elderly, as we've already heard, but can be found in all areas of society, affecting immigrants, bereaved people, those living with disabilities, those with a terminal illness, the LGBTI community, people from ethnic minorities, people with mental health issues, actually anyone. And due to the surging use of social media, or anti-social media, as John Scott has just told us, concerns have also been expressed about loneliness in younger people after psychologists have found that more time spent online can actually increase feelings of loneliness due to minimised real-world interactions. And the human cost of loneliness and social isolation cannot be understated. We already know that loneliness can have a massive negative effect on mental health, and now the potential damage to physical health is also becoming apparent. Um, and I was pleased to hear Alison Johnston mention uh, Tony from the Mental Health Foundation. He's actually in the gallery today. I'd just like to say hello to him. Um, the Mental Health Foundation and uh, Age Scotland have both identified loneliness as one of the leading public health challenges of our time. And a contribution to the British Medical Journal in 2016 highlighted that loneliness is associated with a 30% higher risk of stroke and heart disease. And other research conducted by charities indicate that being lonely can be as bad for your health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day, poses greater harm than not exercising, and is twice as harmful as being obese. President officer, thankfully recent awareness of this issue has inspired people to act, and I would like to take this opportunity to thank some of them here today. People like Mamie Thompson at NHS Highland, who champions the Reach Out campaign, which was launched in 2016 and aims at combating loneliness and social isolation in the Highlands. Reach Out aims to make a difference to the lives of individuals who may be lonely and also involved an online pledge for members of the public to display their commitment to help those in need of support. And the campaign even inspired an 88-year-old woman living in Spain to make the kind offer of weekly correspondence via email to any Scots who feel lonely or isolated. I would also like to give my sincere thanks to Kirsten Campbell at Befriending Caithness and her team, a project run by Caithness Voluntary Group, which also aimed to end loneliness in the community by supporting volunteers to make visits to those who require the service. And they also carry out fantastic intergenerational work with schools and nurseries where pupils get to visit people in hospitals and care homes who do not get many visitors. The difference Befriending Caithness is making to the lives of the service users is huge. And as we've heard from many other contributors today, people are enjoying socialising together. They're being brought together through the service from various areas, sparking conversation. They've not seen or have been unable to see each other. Friends have been reunited um, due to mobility problems and other health issues. Befriendies have said that they are feeling alive again. They look forward to seeing each other. They feel healthy and have increased confidence. And people who felt that they could not go out in the past are now doing so, meeting others with their befriender, visiting the cinema and other places of interest. And meeting up with the service users also makes a positive impact upon the lives of the volunteers as well. I've had the pleasure of seeing some of the other work in the constituency firsthand. Lindsay Tennant at the Brora Village Hub the two primary schools in WIC that undertake visits and projects, and the young people that have worked towards their Duke of Edinburgh Award through volunteering. In a report compiled recently by NHS Highland on isolation, the evidence does suggest that the interventions which support people to become active participants in group activities rooted in their communities is one of the most successful ways of reducing loneliness. And although the undertaking to end loneliness and social isolation can seem like an almost impossible task, it is something that each and every one of us can do something about. Even if we don't volunteer specifically with a befriending service, we can reach out more to those around us. We can engage with our neighbours. We can invite someone out for a coffee. Even the smallest of actions can have a positive impact. And I was also pleased to hear Alec Cole Hamilton speak about ACEs and childhood trauma. And this is a hugely important issue. And I do have a members debate next week, so I'm looking forward to his contribution to that debate as well. Presiding officer, my final thanks goes to Jean Freeman, the Social Security Minister, 
for all her hard work and for taking this issue so seriously. So if you haven't done so already, read the document, take time to respond to the Scottish Government's consultation and think about what you can do to help others. And remember, you don't have to be alone to be lonely. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms Ross. I call Alec Rowley to be followed by Bob Doris. Mr Rowley, please. Presiding officer, in supporting the motion and the Labour amendment, there isn't anything in the motion, the amendment or in the strategy that I think people would object to. And as we have seen from the many briefs from a range of organisations such as Age Scotland, the Co-op Party, the Red Cross, Marie Curie and the Mental Health Foundation, there is real support in the country for such a strategy and indeed there is a lot of work, very good work going on across Scotland. I also saw yesterday the announcement by the UK government that they have appointed a minister for loneliness. So there is a consensus across political parties and civic society that social isolation and loneliness is a very real issue in communities across our country. On that, we are united. But I was very struck yesterday by the comments of the CEO of Food Train, a third sector charity in North Ayrshire, who told the national newspaper, and I quote, without action, this strategy is just words on a page. The funding for this organisation rely, that relies on comes from the Local Health and Social Care Partnership, the Integrated Joint Board. In the real world of Scotland today, many of the IGBs are reporting massive overspends and are facing real-term cuts to their budgets moving forward. They are struggling to fund the very care packages people need to get out of hospital and to have security in their community, never mind supporting the funding of community groups. I was also struck a few weeks ago seeing a worker from a health charity interviewed on the Scottish News. She said that the strategy and policies of the Scottish Government for the issues that that charity dealt with were brilliant. But she then went on to say that on the ground local authority budgets are being cut and they're not able to implement the strategies. And this is the key question. At which point does the strategy we agree in this Parliament become little more than rhetoric, bits of paper gathering, gathering dust on shelves? Because there is no resources out there in communities in order to action the strategy. To make this point further, I would refer to an interview in the Eye and the Scotsman on the 2nd of January this year with the Chair of the Poverty and Inequality Commission, Douglas Hamilton. Speaking about the Child Poverty Bill, Mr Hamilton said, setting targets is commendable, but would be meaningless unless it is followed up by bold action. He said, and I quote, there is a real danger of complacency setting in with politicians and political parties generally agreeing about tackling poverty. You get to the situation where almost everyone agrees. People come up from Westminster and say, it's amazing. The rhetoric is completely different up here. It's much more progressive. But he then continued to say, we don't have actions that match up to that. And that is exactly what we need, actions. It's not... Yeah. Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Rowley. I'm sure Mr Rowley will also agree, though, that it's precisely to respond to those comments and that we need actions to match our words that this government has asked the Poverty and Inequality Commission to look in detail as part of its first piece of work on our child poverty delivery plan that comes from that Child Poverty Act. So I'm sure he, like we, look forward to what Mr Hamilton and his colleagues have to say to us when they return with that task, which this government has set them. Mr Rowley. I, I hope the Minister is not taking offence at the comments from Mr Hamilton. I think the point he makes is absolutely correct. You can have all the strategies in the world, but if you don't have the budgets in order to fund the local community action, then nothing happens. And that's the reality where we are. And that's exactly why we need action. 
It is not simply a case of words on a page, no matter how commendable those words are. Unless strategy is followed up with real and meaningful action, the problems we face as a society will not go away. For action to happen, we need resources that can be focused on the delivery of the strategy. And we need joined up government at every level, all of which I'm afraid is not happening from the evidence that we can see today. Priority one in the Scottish Government report on tackling social isolation and loneliness states that we must empower communities to lead. It says we should do that by building cohesive communities and investing in resources. I could not agree more. However, the reality is that the resources are being stripped from local communities through sustained cuts to local services budgets, with cuts in turn being passed on to third sector and community organisations. So I'm afraid the rhetoric is not backed up by the practice. Priority two talk, talks about tackling poverty, addressing inequality, and to promote and improve health and well-being. Yet we see that poverty is growing, inequality widening, and our health and social care services are in crisis. And whilst I recognise the £500,000 investment in a social isolation and loneliness fund, it doesn't offset the millions upon millions of pounds being stripped out from local budgets right across Scotland. How does that sit with the ambition of promoting and improving health and well-being? What can be lonelier than being stuck in a hospital bed waiting on a social care package and not knowing whether that social care package will come or not? If we are to be serious about tackling these issues, we need to start to address the chronic level of cuts to our local services and local community and third sector organisations, as it is these frontline services that deliver the biggest impact on people's lives. Don't let it be said in the years to come, the Scottish Parliament was brilliant at policy and strategy, but a complete failure when it came to delivering. Thank you, Mr Rowley. I call Bob Doris to be followed by Claire Hawkey. Ms uh, Hawkey will be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr Doris, please. Thank you very much, President Officer. I think that last speech was a little bit out of tone and step with the rest of the debate, to be fair. Yeah, yeah. Um, we heard a lot of rhetoric yesterday around the budget. I won't take the debate in relation to empty rhetoric and words without policies after Mr Kelly's statement yesterday in this chamber. But I think we'll leave that sitting there as gently as we possibly can. Mr Rowley. Now, I think what a lot of people have wanted to do here is draw on really good examples from their own constituencies that they think could actually be used to be rolled out across Scotland and exemplary best practice to develop connectivity and to tackle loneliness uh, and isolation. And uh, like everyone else, I would seek to, to, to do some of that. So I'd like to start actually with uh, loneliness and isolation in relation to young people in, in the first instance. And I note that uh, Childline said that last year it had 4,063 uh, young people in counselling sessions where uh, loneliness was a huge focus in relation to what their problems and issues were. And 70, it's worth noting that 73% of those young people were, were girls. Um, so I thought about what could the Royal Schools do and what are maybe some of the schools in my constituency doing that could, 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 could show an example of what we could do more in. Uh, and I thought about uh, the relatively new, he's not that new now, the relatively new head teacher of John Paul Academy, John McGee, the first time I met him, said to me, and we weren't talking about loneliness, we were talking about attainment. He, he said to me, you know, I'm determined to look through every child in my school and the data we have for them and work out, you know, who's in a club, who's in a society, who takes part in sports groups, who goes on trips, you know, who's in active outer school activities, whether it's organised by the school or by the local youth club. But then who's not in any of that? Because the young people that are not in any of that are the ones that are most likely to suffer in relation to attainment. I suspect they might also be a key group that might be quite likely to suffer in terms of loneliness and isolation. So it just got me to wonder during this debate, is there something in relation to how our schools can help us identify young people at risk of that loneliness and isolation? So I just put that down there as an idea because the consultation asks us to come up with ideas that could be used to develop the strategy and to, to, to make it 
effective. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about older people and loneliness and, and, and isolation. I'm actually really lucky in Glasgow, Mary Hill and Springburn. I've got some amazing, amazing groups and I won't be able to mention them all. I'll just name check some quickly, but I'll miss lots out. So, you know, older per persons groups called the Monday Clubs, actually a lot of them, because they meet in the, the it's, it's Monday lunch times they meet in Summerston and Codder and Lamb Hill, the absolutely amazing Alive and Kicking project at Red Road in Springburn, that I think every time there's an election on, every politician wants to go there because they're just such an amazing, uh, you know, a active ageing community. And that's quite an important one to, to mention uh, to, to the Minister in relation to that connectivity and getting away from isolation because they've actually got their own premises. They've actually got a large hall, they've got a kitchen, they've got a stage, they run their own shows three, four, five times a year, they organise trips. They're very well funded, but they do a lot of fundraising themselves and there's a template there that is quite simply outstanding. Uh, we, we heard a little bit there about the role of planning in relation to uh, tackling loneliness and connectivity and getting services in. It's worth saying that the Alive and Kicking project, they will have a certain future because the political will is there, but when the Red Road flats were demolished and their building was in a poor condition, no one thought about their relocation. So they're regenerating an area of the local authority, but they've not thought about a key aspect of a key facility and amenity in that area. And that was just wrong. Not through any ill will, but it's just poor planning. I think that's a cultural thing, not just not just for Glasgow. I'm not singling out Glasgow, but I think perhaps across the country. Yes, of course. Monica Lennon. To Bob Doris for taking intervention. Does the member hope, as I do, that the, the planning bill is an opportunity to rebalance the planning system, not just about people's rights at the start of the process, but also at the end? So how can we work towards equalising rights of appeal, for example? Does, does Bob, have a, Bob Doris have a view on that? Mr Doris. I, I might not take up the cudgels of equalised rights of appeal, because that's a whole wider debate I think we have to have, but you're absolutely right in relation to local place plans, for example, and how that feels into local development plans which we're going to see a little bit about, but I won't now. I'll move on to my next section, but it is about maybe a little bit of local place plans. So if you stayed in Springburn um, and it was after 5, 5.30 at night and you wanted to go out, it's dark. There is nowhere to go. Everywhere is closed. That is poor planning. Loneliness, isolation and lack of connectivity. And we should ask that question of all towns right across Scotland. After 5 p.m., after 5.30, where can you go? That's an important thing to ask as well. Uh, I, I, I can take an intervention. How much time do I have left? We have plenty of time. Yes, of course. Mr Rowley. I'm grateful for Bob Doris taking an intervention. And can I say to him, regardless of whether it's Tory austerity, a failure by the SNP to stand up to austerity, a failure by Labour, to, to offer an alternative to stay, regardless of all of that, does he accept that right across Scotland, youth services are, are being cut? The CLD departments within local authorities have shrunk through sustained budget cuts over years. So when you ask the question, where is there for young people to go? Then part of the answer to that is that the youth services that were in place when I grew up are not there today for our young people. Mr Doris. I see you've still got the tone wrong, Mr Riley. Um, so, so in my constituency, it could be young people's futures in Postle Park. It could be North United Communities in Wineford and Rock Hill. It could be Royston Youth Action. There's a whole plethora of organisations that would always want more money, but they certainly exist, Mr Riley, and I support them in my constituency, let me tell you. Now, yeah, yeah. Now, now, let me tell you about... Uh, I think it was Alison Johnson mentioned... Uh, the, the importance of a phone call once a week. Well, again, a, an example of a best practice, and that would be the Good Morning Service based in, in my constituency. And other ministers have been there in the past. Uh, uh, Ms Freeman, I would love you to go along and see what they have, have to offer. That's not a formal invite. I'm just making you aware of that. But we'd love you to go along. Um, now, now they say that what they do is every single day in the morning, they have a friend on a phone for older people in, in the community. And sometimes, you know, they, they don't talk about, oh, were you okay the night before? They talk about East Enders or Coronation Street or Big Brother or whatever. It doesn't matter. It was just that human connection every single day, 365 days a year, hugely valued. Here's what they say on their website. We want every older person in Scotland to have the opportunity to join our Good Morning community, to be connected, to be safer and to feel valued. Uh, if you would like the service in your area, please contact your local uh, your local councillors and MSP, tell them about it. Well, um, 
I already know about it. We have the service now in the area. We'd love it to be expanded, but I'm now telling the whole parliament. So I'm asking the Scottish Government how they can capacity to build to roll that kind of thing out uh, across Scotland. Final point, if I have time, presiding officer. Yeah. Um, the, uh, in Mary Hill, part of my constituency, uh, one of the issues isn't so much the range of activities that there is to do, it's about not everyone always knowing about the activities. So they're a bit old school in Maryhill. We have the, the MAD directory launched every year, the Maryhill Activities Directory, and it doesn't matter whether it's a judo club, it doesn't matter if it's a pensioners forum, it doesn't matter if it's the bingo, it doesn't matter if it's active walking or cycling or art classes or whatever, it's all in there and it's up to date classes and opportunities, childcare and provisions for the entire year. We've designed an app as well. So sometimes there's a lot of stuff out there, but we don't always get the connections right. So just some suggestions for how to uh, take forward that strategy and mentioning some good practice in my constituency as well. And thank you the opportunity to present officer to take part in this debate. Yeah. Thank you very much. I call Claire Hawkey, last speaker in the open debate. We obviously then move to closing speeches. That's a red alert. Tell me this should be in the chamber, Ms Hawkey. Thank you, presiding officer. And I remind members of my entry in the register of interest as I'm a mental health nurse who holds an honorary contract with NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. From listening to the other speakers in today's debate, it's clear that we all agree that action must be taken to address loneliness and social isolation. I'm sure you will agree, presiding officer, it was at points a difficult debate to listen to. Indeed, at times saddening to hear the different testimonies and experiences and the effect loneliness can have on our fellow Scots. As a mental health nurse of over 30 years, the devastating effect loneliness and social isolation can have on someone's health is indisputable and the problem only seems to be becoming more prevalent. Research shows, as we've heard, that in terms of mortality, loneliness is more damaging than obesity, and that lacking social connections is as harmful to our health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. As society changes, thankfully, there is an increasing acknowledgement that loneliness and social isolation should be treated as a major public health issue, particularly for its effect on a person's mental health. It seems rather perverse that in an increasingly connected world that our human interactions are reducing. Nearly 20% of older adults in Scotland see technology as being a cause of loneliness as it often replaces human contact. However, despite the fact loneliness is mostly associated with our elderly population, it permeates throughout the whole of our society and across all age groups. Commissioned by the Scottish Government and completed by NHS Scotland, research shows that 11% of adults in Scotland often feel lonely, whilst a significant minority of children are vulnerable to social isolation because of bullying or poor, poor, poor peer support. There's no escaping the fact that loneliness and social isolation can lead to depression, stress, anxiety and a lack of confidence, so it's vital that we're able to tackle the issue head on. I would like to thank the Mental Health Foundation for their assistance in preparing for this debate and in particular Tony Giuliano who I see has joined us today and I fully agree with their assertion that this is a serious public health issue and that the Scottish Government's commitment to developing a strategy on this is a welcome step forward. The Government's draft document is an essential platform to build on so I repeat the calls that all stakeholders should participate in the consultation before it ends on the 30th of April. The publication of the draft strategy is a clear commitment from the Scottish Government that they are willing to show leadership to address the issue. However, we cannot disregard the central role that communities play too. Indeed, as the Minister for Social Security said in the consultation document, the biggest impact can only be delivered if we enable communities themselves to lead this work. In my constituency of Rutherglen, I have an inspiring example of a person who is at the forefront of, challenge, of the challenge in tackling loneliness and social isolation locally, and he is absolutely dedicated in bringing communities together. My constituent, Gordon McLean from Rutherglen, is a volunteer and the chairperson of local organisation Grow 73. Grow 73 is a community gardening group whose ethos is that by bringing people together to grow fruit, vegetables and plants, the whole community as, uh, the community as a whole will be able to grow too. Gordon works closely with his colleagues, Lynn and Eugenie, whose dedication, passion and drive have been instrumental in shaping the person he is today. According to the research undertaken by NHS Scotland, 22% of people do not feel that they have a strong sense of belonging to their local community. 
So we all therefore have a responsibility to ensure that our communities are more connected and cohesive so that no one is left behind. And in that regard, each week, Grow 73 holds a weekly Monday meet-up in Rutherglen, which is open to all and simply consists of small walks or planting throughout a local park. A dedicated number of people turn up every week, some of whom are retired, some are in work, some unable to work. Some come with their families, come with their children who are in school or even at nursery. Gordon is clear that their weekly event allows people to meet up with others for meaningful social interaction, which they may not have otherwise had the opportunity to experience. Recognising Gordon's commitment in tackling loneliness and social isolation, he was invited by the Eden Project to attend the launch of the Great Get Together campaign, which was set up in the memory of the late Joe Cox. Joe Cox's family and son friends came up with the initiative. And now in conjunction with the Eden Project's Big Lunch Project, a programme, they encourage communities across the UK to have lunch with their neighbours once a year in a simple act of community, friendship and fun. And following on from this example, Gordon and Grow 73 held such an event at Overton Park in Rutherglen, which was a remarkable success, drawing together people of all ages. Communities themselves are best placed to ensure people who may be at risk of becoming isolated or lonely can access the support they need. And I welcome the government's acknowledgement that communities should be the focal point in tackling the issue. Presiding officer, I take pride in the fact that the SNP Scottish Government will be one of the first countries in the world to develop a national strategy to address loneliness and isolation. However, what gives me even greater pride is seeing people like Gordon in our communities who are leading the way. Loneliness and social isolation should not remain a silent epidemic. So please speak out if you're needing help. Thank you. Uh, before I move to closing speeches, I say I'm disappointed at Kenneth Gibson and Gail Ross. Neither of them is in the chamber for closing speeches. That's disrespectful to the chair and disrespectful to members in the chamber. And I expect a note to my colleagues and myself as to why they're not in the chamber. Mr. Cole Hamilton, please close the Liberal Democrats. You've got seven minutes. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I start by echoing Bob Doris in uh, giving my thanks for what I think has been an excellent debate, very full of consensus. I'm grateful in particular for the tone set by the cabinet, set, or by the minister at the very top of the debate, particularly in her speech when she uh, sought to heap praise across party lines, both on the newly appointed Minister for Loneliness uh, in Westminster, Tracy Crouch, but of course in the late, great Joe Cox, whose work, as Mark Griffin uh, reminds us, continues to this day in much of what we have discussed this afternoon. In my opening remarks, I talked about the human condition and that we are, in essence, a social animal. Certainly, there are those of us who enjoy our own company and who would readily seek out space and time alone. But there is a massive difference between those who seek out the peace that solitude can bring and those who have loneliness thrust upon them. As the old French novelist Balzac said, solitude is fine, but you always need someone to tell you it's fine. Indeed, it is possible to exist amongst a sea of people and yet still feel totally and hopelessly alone. And John Scott reminded us that that, a, that reality is in fact ages old in terms of the, the plight of women just after the outbreak of the First World War and in terms of uh, the, the many hidden corners of our society for centuries, this has been a reality. And the statistics speak for themselves. 200,000 older Scots go half a week or more without a visit or a phone call. Half of all 75-year-olds say that their main form of company is either television or a pet. And in any given year, and this speaks to the ageless quality of loneliness, there are 15,000 children in the care of this state who grapple with attachment disorder, trauma and loss, only to have that isolation worsen still further when the day comes around where they have to leave their placement and take up their first tenancy. Whilst it's certainly possible to identify groups at greater risk of isolation, loneliness really doesn't draw any distinction across class, age or geography. People are lonely for many, many reasons, and often, as I said earlier, exist in plain sight. Now, we have heard this afternoon many excellent examples, and I was very struck, I think, um, by the Minister's four questions which she posed to the Chamber in her opening remarks. And the most important of these, to my mind, was the last. What can I do? 
We often hope that the, the machinery and the apparatus of government will, through the votes that we cast in this place and the decisions that we make in this place, will somehow clunk into action and address any particular social issue of the day. But on this, perhaps above any other issue, we hold key to at least part of that answer in how we treat each other and in how we reach out to those around us. And Claire Hawhey has just reminded us of the big get-together weekend. And that was uh, one of the first times, I think, in a while that we in my small cul-de-sac of six houses have actively sought out each other's company. But what I particularly liked about this debate was the range, the massive plethora of local examples, of great organizations and community spirit that is alive in this well uh, and well in this country. We heard from Kenneth Gibson and Ruth McGuire and others about Food Train, which sounds like an amazing initiative. And I really hope that that campaign to save it is successful. I particularly like to associate myself and, and these benches with the call from Annie Wells for a national day around this issue. I think it's something that we need to, to keep fixated on and reminding ourselves each and every year. Monica Lennon, in a typically excellent speech, um, was, as well as making some very cheerful remarks about the Liberal Democrat Amendment, made a very important point about crafting our response to this across every political policy directorate in the Scottish Government. It's very easy to think that this is the preserve of perhaps uh, the Minister's brief, but actually there are elements of this in every department in the Scottish Government government and she also took up the importance of inter intergenerational interventions and I thank her for that and we're reminded of the co-location of nurseries and care homes for older people in other parts of the world and we are uh, obviously have lots to learn from overseas. Now I always enjoy contributions of Jeremy Balfour particularly when he evokes the great Simon and Garfunkel but he I think delivered a very eloquent speech and uh, also put, talked about the strain on local GP practices in prescribing when he referenced the fact that a third of prescriptions wouldn't be necessary if we could combat the isolation that had brought people there in the first place. And Graham Day built on this by making important points about how GPs and other primary care professionals <coughs> represent the first line in identification of those who are lonely in our society because people don't always come forward to that end. It's, it's a point that, that Sandra White made, I think, very importantly, that, uh, that there is a stigma associated with this. We've cracked it in a number of ways around getting people to understand and talk about mental health, but it feels like with loneliness, we're just a little step behind there because there's something associated, there's baggage associated by sort of coming forward and saying that you are lonely or isolated. And Gail Ross made an excellent speech. I want to put on record my gratitude for her bravery over Christmas in talking openly in the national press about her own mental health. And she reminded that there are those champions individually working for the rights and interests of people who are isolated in our community. So I'm very grateful for the collective support around our amendment. We have much to do around the built environment, ensuring that the new build environment that we create uh, builds communities and not dormitories, but we make sure that the older uh, settled communities that we already have are well served and maintained so that people's social orbit are not limited by their fear of leaving their home uh, and falling in the street. And uh, I think also I, I very much welcome the consensus around traumatic life events that that these can actually set in train a, a response, a human response at a molecular level within people, which sets a course through, lo um, through their lives, which brings about many, many negative social outcomes. There are many lofty social policy answers to this, but as we've heard throughout the debate today, a thousand seemingly tiny acts of human kindness can move a mountain as big as this, and they are needed. They are needed now more than ever. Significant pressures on mental health services and national suicide rates rising by 8% last year alone. The need for a concerted cross-chamber action on this matter is acute. Now, the founding principles of this parliament established this chamber to give voice to those who had struggled to be heard. Today's debate, the government's continuing work towards the strategy and the unified consensus we have forged today go some way to helping us give comfort and company to those in isolation as well. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Dave, David Stewart, close for Labour. Seven minutes, please. I know you have no trouble filling seven minutes. <laughs> Thank you for your confidence, President Officer. Um, this has been uh, an excellent debate with sparkling and well-informed contributions from across the chamber. Many members rightly referred to the tragedy of the murdered Labour MP Joe Cox and the loneliness commission set up to tackle 
the issue the late MP cared so passionately about. The Commission's recommendation, as many members referred to, is that there should be a minister responsible for a national strategy to combat loneliness has been, as we've heard, accepted by the Prime Minister. Uh, Tracy Crouch, the Minister for Sport and Civil Society, will lead on loneliness to head up the UK Government's work to tackle a problem that is believed to affect 9 million people in the UK. As Gail Ross said, um, you do not have to be alone to be lonely. I have personal experience of loneliness and social isolation. In my early 20s, and yes, presiding officer, I was young once, uh, I, volunteered to, I volunteered to work with the Samaritans in my home city of Inverness. Many of the calls I took in my day shift or overnight were from desperately sad, lonely people, some of whom also had physical and mental health problems. And as the Joint Court of Group and British Red Cross report trapped in a bubble, and refer members to my membership of the Scottish uh, Cooperative Party, uh, loneliness people mistakenly perceive as an issue faced either solely or predominantly by older people. On a personal level, I was inspired by my volunteering and I trained as a social worker, which led to a 16-year career as a frontline worker and middle manager, including specialised training on mental health. And loneliness and social isolation has been well documented in this debate to affect physical as well as mental health. They cause, as we heard in the debate, greater risk of coronary heart disease and stroke, high risk of alcohol consumption and smoking, lower levels of physical exercise, and substantial increases the chance of dementia among older uh, people. On top of this, the chances of suffering from isolation and loneliness is exacerbated greatly by social and economic inequalities. It's absolutely key to building a better Scotland. We tackle this public health challenge head on. In my region, presiding officer in Highlands Zions, the likelihood of feeling cut off from society is not helped, of course, by the squeeze in public services. And with people living in isolated rural and super rural areas, Access to support networks, family and friends, local groups or charities are already more limited and this is made worse with poor public transport links. Accessibility and affordability are key factors and with the withdrawal of more and more rural bus services and underinvestment in North Highland rail links, this only emphasises the remoteness of the region. That said, presiding officer, some excellent local charities should get a mention, as other members have done, who have, have the objective to mitigate isolation and loneliness. For example, the Highland Hospice Helping Hands Befriending Services offers visits to the home of people with terminal illness. They match each person with their own befriender based on their needs, able to offer social and practical help. A new project has also been trialled with a run of four months in the Western Isles at the moment. Uh, the Well Connected Communities is supported by Support in Mind, the Mental Health Charity and the National Rural Mental Health Forum. And across the Highlands and in Gail and Butte, Befrienders Highland offers befriending by phone, letter, email and in group sense as well. So as I said, I thought this was an excellent debate. The Minister kicked off and reminded us the major impact on health and well-being of loneliness and social isolation, not restricted to the elderly, and she commended the previous Parliament's Equal, Oppor uh, Community, the Equal Opportunities report. And she also referred rightly to the Joe Cox Commission on Loneliness, and I welcome, as others have done, uh, the launch of the draft strategy on social isolation and loneliness. I thought Annie Wells made a very good speech, and she was encouraged by the national strategy, and again, she emphasised the importance and issues about socialisation and the links with the major, as a major public health issue. She also made the very valid point about how technology is replacing face-to-face -face contact in modern society. Monica Lennon flagged up that Labour had the 2016 manifesto promise on socialisation and loneliness, talked about the Joe Pox Commission, as others have done, about the UK figure of 9 million people uh, being lonely, and also flagged up in the year of young people in 2018, we need more actions to target young people uh, and the links with good mental health. Uh, Alec Cole-Hamilton, I think, made a very valid point that we all perhaps look towards Christmas and New Year as a high point of our social calendar, but for many who are socially isolated, it's a very negative time. He made a very good link about the links with loneliness and mental health and stressed the golden thread of volunteering, the very important role that volunteering has in Scotland uh, today. 
And Kenny Gibson uh, quite rightly talked about the, the importance of having a better Scotland is to tackle loneliness and social isolation. Uh, Jeremy Balfour, uh, I think, got the best laugh in the chamber when he talked about Murder Monroe's constant approaches onto Facebook. <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> Murder um, and but I'm sure that's correct. I, I don't have personal evidence about that. But also made a very valid point about uh, social prescribing and the key point about how well do I get on with my neighbours. And Jeremy, uh, Graham Day, sorry, talked about people and communities having social connection with neighbours and the very valid point, which I would agree with, the real crucial issue about ensuring that we have a strategy uh, for rural areas as well. Uh, and uh, Mark, Cox, uh, Mark Griffin apologies, mentioned the Joe Cox work in Parliament and the innovative work of the Commission. And apologies to other members that I don't have time to refer to. Uh, in conclusion, presiding officer, I welcome this positive and productive debate to build a connected Scotland to tackle social isolation and loneliness. Social isolation recognises no age, no class, no gender. Let us recognise the passion of Jo Cox's crusade against loneliness and the importance of her legacy still living on in her commission. All we need to succeed, presiding officer, is the will to do and the soul to dare. Thank you very much, Mr Stewart. I call Miles Briggs uh, to close the Conservatives. Up to nine minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I'm pleased to close what I think has been a useful and positive debate today. Um, there have been some excellent contributions from across members in the Chamber and, it's good, and a good deal of recognition to the extent of the challenges we face and some welcome consensus, I think, of what actually needs to be done and how we as a Parliament can make a difference. As other members have already done, I very much concur with the joint briefings received for today from both the Mental Health Foundation Scotland and Age Scotland that states that loneliness is one of the leading public health challenges of our time, with more than 100,000 older people in our country now classed as being chronically lonely. In, in an advanced, wealthy, developed society like ours, this cannot be right and something this Parliament and all parties can play a role in solving. Many members have focused rightly on the mental ill health that can be caused by social isolation and loneliness. And it's a key trigger of depression and low mood and can be linked to a significant number of suicides, especially amongst elderly members in our communities. Loneliness puts individuals at greater risk of cognitive decline. And it's worth reflecting that one recent academic study had indicated that loneliness has a 64% increased chance of then developing clinical dementia. Improving Scotland's mental well-being is extricably linked, I think, to also tackling social isolation. And we need to see strategies on both these issues, which very closely align, I believe, to complement each other and reinforce each other on that. I was also very struck by research highlighted by Channel 4 before Christmas, which starkly set out just how harmful loneliness and social isolation are to physical health as well as people's mental health. The research showed that lacking social connections is as damaging to our health as has been already mentioned as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Indeed, it's estimated that loneliness increases the likelihood of mobility by 10%. And as a Lothian MSP, I shared the concern and indeed surprise of many other fellow residents here in Edinburgh when the capital was described as the loneliest city in the UK in December. And it was revealed that broadly about 60,000 people across uh, above the age of 65 in Scotland would be spending Christmas Day alone. Clearly we need to do much more, but we should be proud of some of the first class work which has been highlighted during the debate, and that work which has also been undertaken in Edinburgh and the Lothians I would like to highlight. We should also commend the dedication and effort of those who are giving their time as befrienders, as volunteers in their communities, either formally or informally. And I was pleased recently to meet with Vintage Vibes here in Parliament. They're a fantastic dynamic organisation that have created dozens of successful matches between older people here in Edinburgh and their volunteers. And ahead of Christmas, they ran a, a cosy Christmas campaign launched by Gail Porter, which encouraged people to send a Christmas card and an information pack to isolated older people here in the capital. I must admit that I wrote mine at the back of chamber here in one FMQs ahead of uh, the Christmas uh, break. And for me, I felt that was the most productive FMQs I'd, I'd actually been involved in. But despite being a new charity, 
Only operating since April 2016, they've already won Age Scotland's Pat Patrick Brooks Award for Best Working Partnership and were a finalist in Generations Working Together new International Award project, project Award. And I wish them continued success as they plan to expand their services across Edinburgh and Lothians in the future. As Annie Wells outlined, contact the elderly. Is, um, yes. Monica Lennon. I'm grateful to Miles Briggs and I think we all congratulate the many charities and volunteers who we've all name-checked today. Would Miles Briggs also recognise the important role that, that volunteers and food banks play right across Scotland? And I think we put a challenge to, to the Minister Jade Freeman today to work across government and look at the impact of all policy decisions. Will the Scottish Conservatives be writing to Tracy uh, Sorry, Couch, Crouch, we're getting our names wrong today. To Tracy Crouch, not just to congratulate her, but also to ask her what she will do to uh, make representations to other new members of the government. For example, Esther McVeigh in the Department of Working Pensions, because we have to recognise the impact of inward poverty, of benefit sanctions on people's mental health, on their physical health, and how they feel within communities. I'd be grateful. Miles Briggs. Well, I think this debate's actually outlined actually how tackling this issue of social, isola social isolation is one we all need to work across, not only in this parliament, but in our councils and at Westminster. And to move on from, from that, what I had um, been looking to actually then highlight is what Anna, Anna, uh, Annie Wells had mentioned, and that was the work of Contact the Elderly, which is another brilliant charity working in my region, which actually organises Sunday afternoon tea parties for small groups of older people, aged 75 and over, who live alone, of offering regular and vital community links each month. As Equal Access Programme provides a similar service as well here for people from minority ethnic communities who can often experience language and cultural challenges. And it's their programme, Our Community Navigator Project, also working here in the southwest and southeast of Edinburgh, that helps people over 65 find out what's on or near them and how they can access support they need in a way that they want. All of, all of us in this chamber should do what we can to support these organisations and others like them and encourage constituents to volunteer for them and so that they can build up their capacity and increase the number of people who they, they are actually actively helping. We believe the Scottish Government should look at setting up a new community mental health development fund to help increase the capacity for social prescribing, establish new groups and help fund projects across Scotland. Health boards and local authorities could also be able to bid alongside these organisations and community groups. Investment in social prescribing is, I believe, an important part of the preventative health agenda and can reduce costs in our NHS. Some studies have shown that people accessing social prescribing schemes reduce their visits to their GPs by 66%, as was outlined by Graham Day. It has therefore been concerning to meet with a number of GPs who have actually expressed to me some of their concerns around the ALICE system in GP surgeries, which is meant to help link individuals and organisations in their communities. And it's clear that the link workers, although that is very welcome, have a lot, to, a lot of work to do to make this actually a system which will work across Scotland. And while many groups and charities offer formal volunteering opportunities for members of the public, I think we should all be sending out the message today that every single one of us can actually play a part in reducing social, social isolation by sometimes taking very small actions that can make a huge difference. This can include checking on an elderly neighbour or every now and again or asking them if they want to drop around uh, for coffee occasionally. And one of the pro programmes which I saw quite recently, which I was really impressed with, was one called Spare a Chair Scheme, which encouraged people to offer a neighbour to come round on Sunday uh, for Sunday lunch or dinner. And that's actually what uh, one member outlined earlier as something they had uh, seen happening in their, their own area. One final point which I wanted to make with regards to the strategy and other strategies which the government have outlined, which I think is missing, and I hope ministers will take this as constructive criticism, and that is actually the issue of death. Death is a very difficult subject for many of us to talk about, and for someone who is dying and who has been given a terminal illness can be the loneliest time in their lives. The excellent befriending, which that's the excellent briefing, I apologise, which was provided for by uh, Marie Curie ahead of today's debate, highlights the many challenges people face. In many cases, individuals withdraw from their social structures, be that the local bowling club, and in many cases, they also withdraw from their families and friends. Sadly, for many people with a terminal illness, they also feel the disease or condition 
um, that treat and the treatment they are receiving um, can change their sense of identity. So it's important, I think, to consider the impact of bereavement following a death on loved ones as well and the support we provide. And I hope that's a positive um, suggestion um, as we move forward with the strategy. To conclude, Deputy Presiding Officer, I again very much welcome today's debate and the tone which we've discussed this topic and the positive speeches from across the chamber. Um, I'd like to finally close with um, also paying tribute to the work of the late Joe Cox MP, and I think that's um, been a theme throughout uh, the debate today. I was very interested to read in The Guardian yesterday, and I can see from the Labour Party's faces they're surprised that uh, even some of us on these benches read The Guardian. But um, Joe's sister, Kim, um, wrote about how Joe felt profoundly isolated both when she went to university and when she became a mother. And that was what drove her to working towards tackling uh, isolation and loneliness and a cause which she started her work on as a new MP, setting up the Independent Cross-Party Commission. And we've seen just this week how that is also starting to make a real difference. I hope for all of us in this chamber, Joe's legacy uh, will be that we also dedicate ourselves to doing that work and that we in this parliament can commit today to play our part. Thank, Thank you. you. I call on Jean Freeman to close for the government minister till five o'clock, please. Thank you very much, <clears throat> excuse me, presiding officer. Let, let me begin by thanking members for their valuable contributions today. I have taken extensive notes and we will follow up on many of the ideas that have been raised. Let me too uh, thank both Tony Giuliano from the Mental Health Foundation and Derek Young, who is also in the gallery from uh, Age Scotland. I'm grateful to both organisations for the, the work that they do, but also for taking the time uh, to be part of this debate today and hear what we've got to say. Uh, Annie Wells pointed uh, quite rightly to our increasingly independent and transient lives. But for me, importantly, she didn't stop there, but went on to point to a range of existing and potential new intergenerational work and ideas that I will want to discuss further with her and with her colleagues, and the importance of effective measurement in our strategy, uh, a point uh, that I took well on board. So I am very happy uh, to indicate that we will support the amendment in her name. I want to take this opportunity, presiding officer, because I've not had it until now, to welcome Monica Lennon to her new responsibility. I'm grateful to her for this, her support, and I look forward to working uh, with her and taking up her offer of working together on this issue and on others. In my opening remarks, I raised the value of kindness. So let me, in that spirit, gently say that I find it disappointing that in this debate, Labour has found it again necessary to shoehorn in their one-trick party political point based, I have to say, on an inaccurate premise, and by and large, in my view, missing the bigger and much more important point of this debate. So I am unable to accept Labour's amendment. Alec, I have a great deal to do, I'm very sorry. Alec Cole Hamilton made important points in his amendment and in his, as always, eloquent speech about place and space that could easily be ignored. And I think we, uh, I'm grateful to him uh, for doing that and happy to accept uh, and support his amendment. Mark Griffiths raised the issue of carers as I had done. And I am, of course, happy to discuss the points he raised and welcome his offer to do that. But given that he has raised carers' allowance, I feel obliged to put on record that, of course, it will be the first benefit this government will deliver will be an increase to carers' allowance. And a uh, first benefit that I am exceptionally proud will be the one that we will pay such attention to. In the other uh, members' speeches, Ruth Maguire uh, and John Scott also mentioned kindness. And Ruth gave us a very uh, lovely example about how children uh, can offer uh, kindness in all that they do. And I was reminded as she spoke about the time my partner and I moved into our current home and that uh, on the bench outside our front door, someone had left a wee bunch of flowers with a note that said, I'm really sorry, I'm your next door neighbor, couldn't be there today when you moved in, but I just thought I'd leave you this and I'll see you as soon as I can. It didn't take much, but 13 years later, I still remember that and still want to replicate that as much as I can. 
I thought Kenny Gibson's excellent initiative of a door-to-door -door campaign in his constituency is one that each one of us should be thinking about. How can we replicate that in a way that makes sense in our own area? A door-to-door -door campaign, talking to people about the services that are available to them and checking that they know that all that, all that is possible for them. Jeremy Balfour uh, spoke about uh, us working together, an approach I welcome, and about our individual responsibility too. He also mentioned, as did uh, Miles Briggs, uh, vintage vibes, and I had uh, contact with them uh, on their Christmas campaign. I didn't complete the card during FMQs. Uh, we won't tell Ruth, I promise you. Uh, but I did think what a simple idea that was and how easy it was uh, for us to follow through on it. But Mr Balfour also uh, spoke about a breakdown of community and volunteering. And whilst everything we've talked about today uh, has been important, I think we need to also ground ourselves in some of the real positives of our country, one of which is that levels of volunteering have remained relatively stable over the last five years. In 2016, 27% of adults uh, provided unpaid help, and youth volunteering has grown to 52%. It's also the case that our Social Attitudes Survey in 2015 talked about how seven in 10 people in Scotland felt that they belonged to their local area either a great deal or quite a lot. And 76% said that they agreed that they feel that there are people in this area I could turn to for advice and support. I make that point because I think there is a very great deal that we have that we can build on. It's also the case that, as Bob Doris highlighted in his, in his uh, contribution, there is a local initiative across a range of organisations. Mr Doris was pointing uh, to the work in a local school with others and the morning phone call. Initiatives that all of us as individuals uh, can think about how we might take that up. And finally, uh, Graham uh, Day and others mentioned tea parties. I have been fortunate enough myself to attend one. And aside from enjoying the excellent home baking that was provided, uh, I was... Uh, touched and impressed by how those who had come together, as I'd said in my opening remarks, for another purpose, found social connection and new friends. Mr Day also asked about uh, support in terms of additional uh, needs, uh, children with additional needs, and I'm very happy with that important point he's made to take him up and discuss that further. Very many members, Alison Johnson, Sandra White, John Scott, Claire Hockey and others highlighted local, important local initiatives that are community driven and rooted in what their community needs. Gail Ross highlighting the rural campaign and I should mention here my uh, impressive young farmers campaign across Scotland in my own area as in others. Um, and I should also uh, make the point, presiding officer, that I couldn't agree more with Mr Scott that of course in Ayrshire we do know how to do both kindness and community initiatives. Some of the ones he mentioned I recognise, and there are, of course, others in my own area. Presiding officer, I also want to thank the many organisations who work so hard and have got this issue onto the public and our agenda. There's too many to name, but they have worked closely with us to increase our understanding in government and help shape the direction of travel that is now seen in our draft strategy. Yes. Monica Lennon. Um, I think it's right we pay tribute to these organisations, but what does the Minister say, say to organisations who are worried about their funding, like LEAP in Clare Hockey's constituency, who are expecting right now a 15% cut to their budget? Yes, sir. What I say is that uh, my Cabinet Secretary sitting next to me has protected our third sector budget, that Ms Lennon herself signed off on a local government report from our local government committee that recognised the numbers of my finance secretary to my left here and that the premise on which Labour persist in pursuing is utterly inaccurate and misleading and they really ought to stop now if they want to represent the people of Scotland. Let me continue. Let me continue with what matters in this debate. There are too many organisations, as I said, to, to name. We need their continued involvement, their support 
and their challenge to help us realise real change and improvement. We need to hear from those with an opinion, an idea or a view and all our partners to reach them. So I'm very grateful to the many organisations who've already offered their help in holding events and discussions to get the dialogue going around the draft strategy. Presiding officer, I'm delighted to have been able to lead what by and large has been a remarkably constructive debate in the chamber today. I'm also delighted that the Scottish Government is the first administration anywhere in the UK to publish a strategy aimed at reducing social isolation and loneliness. There are many triggers, of course, to loneliness and contributors to social isolation. And I'm grateful to Miles Briggs in his closing remarks for reminding us about those who receive a terminal diagnosis. It is an area of significant importance and one that I know the Cabinet Secretary and I would be interested in discussing further. There are many triggers, but of course, we are not powerless. We have heard today of the many local and important initiatives. We know from the stats how people feel about living in Scotland, and we know about how we're doing well in terms of volunteering. Our draft strategy is a starting point. It doesn't claim to be a comprehensive overview of social isolation and loneliness in Scotland. We need to hear from people within communities, third sector organisations, public bodies and the private sector so that we take this work to secure tangible and meaningful change. We need to hear more from my colleagues in this chamber with the ideas that they've raised in the debate and those who weren't able to take part so that together we show collective leadership. We need to do that together. Loneliness and social isolation can affect any one of us. Tackling it will take all of us. Thank you. Thank you. And that concludes our debate on social isolation and loneliness. Uh, there are four questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is that Amendment 9927.2 in the name of Annie Wells, which seeks to amend Motion 9927 in the name of Jim Freeman, on building a connected Scotland, tackling social isolation and loneliness together be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that Amendment 9927.1 in the name of Monica Lennon, who seeks to amend the motion in the name of Jean Freeman be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 9927.1 in the name of Monica Lennon is yes, 27, no, 76. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that amendment 9927.3 in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton, who seeks to amend the motion in the name of Jean Freeman, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the final question is that motion 9927 in the name of Jean Freeman, as amended, on building a connected Scotland, tackling social isolation and loneliness together be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. I close this meeting.